Ready to roll. Uh, good morning. Uh, my, uh, my name is uh, Dev Ganadev, actually freshly minted president of this board. Uh, just a few rules. I want to ask all of you, please uh, turn off your cell phones to silent and make sure they're off the table so we can avoid feedback noise. You may notice board members accessing their laptops during the meeting. They are using the laptop solely to access the board meeting materials that are in electronic format. This is the official meeting of the Medical Board of California. As such, disruptions of the board's business will not be tolerated. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comment and ask for public comment on each agenda item. I ask that you be respectful of the need to conduct the business of the board. Should anyone disrupt the meeting, I will ask that person to conduct himself or herself in such a manner that permits the board to transact its business. The meeting will be available via teleconference. Individually listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by a moderator who will be facilitating the teleconferencing process. For those members of the public participating via teleconference, please wait until the moderator has introduced you before you make your comments. To request to make a comment during the public comment period, please press star one. You will hear a tone indicating that you are in the queue for comment. If you change your mind and do not want to make a comment, press pound sign. Assistant Assistance is available throughout the teleconference meeting. To request a specialist, press star zero. Each person will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. During the agenda item 16, public comments on, on items not on the agenda, the board has limited the public comment period for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During public comment on any other agenda item, 10 minutes will be allowed. After 10 minutes, no further, no further comments will be accepted. Business services staff will be assisting me with receiving the public comments via tele teleconference during this meeting. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda, and it's, it is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for the public comment on the agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please raise your hand or come forward and you will be recognized. I would like to request all speakers complete their presenter slips so I can call you by name at the appropriate time and that the record of this meeting can be full and complete. However, this is voluntary. Please give uh, the speaker slip to Ms. Toof. Ms. Toof. Ms. Toof, can I, uh, she, you did already. <laughs> I'll do my best to call upon everyone who has supplied a slip for the agenda item and recognize those who wish to make last minute comment. We plan to end the meeting today by 2 p.m. and uh, board members are wishing to end it by noon. We'll see what happens. Uh, I'd like to introduce Kim. And Christine Lally, Deputy Director. Christine, thank you. Thanks for coming. And uh, Ms. Stoop, roll call, please. <clears throat> Dr. Bolat? Present. Dr. Bishop? Here. Judge Feinstein? Here. Dr. Hawkins? Here. Dr. Krause? Present. Ms. Lawson? Here. Dr. Lewis? Present. Ms. Sutton Wills? Here. Mr. Warmoth? Here. Ms. Wright? <clears throat> Dr. Yip? Here. Dr. Ganadev? Here. Thank you. Uh, next one is moving forward to agenda item 16, public comments not on the agenda. Do we have any slips? I have one slip from uh, Christina Hellebrand. Please come in. spoke to you yesterday and I have some follow-up comments on the same topic but a little bit differently. Um, 
as I spoke to you yesterday um, regarding SP277 and the medical exemptions and how doctors are um, being incentivized for fully vaccinating children um, up until the age of two and the kickbacks that they're getting, and I asked you to look into that. And I, what I realized was it's really a broader issue that the doctors are getting kickbacks from a number of for, for doing a number of different processes. It can be um, various surgeries they recommend or, or the one that we're interested in is the vaccination policy but, um, or the vaccination piece of it. But I do ask that you look into that um, look into that fully and, and look at you know whether doctors are really doing what they should be doing because they're getting money incentivized back. Um, the piece that I wanted to talk about today was specifically the medical exemption pilot program that has been put on by the Santa Barbara County um, uh, uh, public health director there, Charity Dean, and um, Dr. Juan, Juana. Um, and it has also been copied in uh, Sacramento County and Marin County. And our concern there is that they are collecting the medical records, the medical exemptions from all the schools um, and looking at them. And there was a meeting, a teleconference on May 13th, which the California Medical Board attended um, to identify suspicious medical exemptions and how to report those suspicious doctors. And my concern there is SB 277 in the law states and specific to Governor Brown's signing statement said that it was at the discretion of the doctor to give those medical exemptions. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, you know, vaccines are claimed to be safe and effective. They are not 100 percent safe and effective. If you just read the package insert, as with any drug, they're not 100% safe and effective. Um, and so there are doctors that are looking, that are using the latest research, some of it you heard yesterday, um, and are doing evaluations really truly on the risk to benefit ratio of vaccines for an individual, not on a mass scale. And those doctors are, are giving medical, some of those doctors are giving medical exemptions when it's appropriate. But I would ask you to please call off the witch hunt on those doctors who are giving medical exemptions um, they're good doctors and they're giving them legally and legitimately and they are doing the ones that we're aware of. They're doing their, um, they're doing their piece um, to help these children. So I would just ask, ask you to, um, to please call off the witch hunt and, and really if you're looking at doctors that don't give the full schedule of vaccines to understand that, that there needs to be those doctors out there for, for our children and for people who are, um, who can be uh, more susceptible to vaccines, not based on the CDC contraindications, but based on their family history. So for example, if a child's sibling has had a seizure or ha has died from a vaccine injury, that that sibling is considered in, in, um, in getting Please a conclude. medical Yes, med getting a medical exemption. So th that is my ask for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hellebrand. So what we are, that's it. Any other public comment for members here? Public comment on the phone? Do we have any comments on the line? Sarah, any comments on the line? We have no questions. Thank you. Thank you. So the next one is a public hearing. So. Agenda item 17, public hearing on consideration and possible action on the proposed regulation for midwife assistants. So this has to go exactly the way it is. This is a public hearing for the state of California. So uh, good morning. My name is Dr. Ganadev, president of the medical board. I'll be presiding over this meeting. This is this is the time and place set by the Medical Board to conduct a public hearing on the proposed regulation to implement, interpret, or make specific section 2516.5 of the Business and Professions Code related to midwife assistants. The Medical Board of California is considering changes to the Division 13 of Title 16 of the California Code of Regulations as described in the notice published in the California Regulatory Notice Register and sent by mail or electronic mail to those on the board's mailing and subscriber list. The legislature adopted Business and Professions Code Section 2516.5 to permit licensed midwives and certified nurse midwives to use midwife assistants in their practices. 
Section 2516.5 sets forth some minimum requirements for midwife assistance, references, standards for medical assistance established by the board pursuant to the Business and Professions Code Section 2069 and indicates that the midwife assistant shall be issued a certificate by the training institution or instructor indicating satisfactory completion of the required training. The section, however, does not specify such details as what the training entitles, who can conduct the training, and who can certify that a midwife assistant meets the minimum requirement. These details have been left to the Medical Board of California to establish via regulations. Additionally, the section authorizes midwife assistants to perform additional midwife technical support services under regulations and standards established by the board. Accordingly, the purpose of this proposed rulemaking is to further define Business and Professions Code Section 2516.5 to make specific the requirements for midwife assistants, the administration of training of midwife assistants, and the requirements for certifying organizations. These regulations are necessary for the consumer protection to ensure that midwife assistants have proper training by supervision. For the records, today's time is July 29, 2016, and this hearing beginning at approximately 9.14 a.m. We ask that persons who wish to testify please fill out a, sleeper, a speaker slip available at the table in the back of the room. The purpose of this meeting is to receive oral testimony concerning the regulatory proposals described in this no notice. Regulations must, com must comply with six legal review standards, which are, one, necessity. Is there a demonstrated ev evidence that there is a need for the regulation? Number two, authority. Does the board have legislated authority to adopt the regulation. Number three, consistency. Does the regulation conflict with our other regulations or statutes? Number four, clarity. Can the regulation be easily understood by those affected? Number five, non-duplication. Does the regulation duplicate other regulations of statutes? Number six, reference. Which statute does the regulation implement, interpret, or make specific? Testimony should be addressed only to these six standards. Before we begin, I would like, like to briefly describe the procedures that will be followed. The entire hearing will be tape recorded. Those persons testifying will not be sworn in or be cross-examined. All recommendations and objections will be considered by, by the board members. Responses to all objections or recommendations will be included in the final statement of reasons. The board will maintain a rulemaking file of this proposed regulatory action. Written comments for the regulation being heard today must have been received by 5 p.m. on July 19, 2016. The recording of this meeting, written testimony, and all written comments received by the deadlines as noticed will become part of that rulemaking file. For the record, no public comment was received, was received. A complete copy of the rulemaking file will be available for review at the Medical Board's office in Sacramento. To ensure fairness and that everything is completely entered into the record and to enable everyone to hear those who are giving testimony, we ask that those testify, testifying follow these procedures. Please speak loudly and very clearly. First, identify yourself and who you represent. Please state your position, support or oppose at the beginning of your testimony. Oral testimony will be limited to five minutes per person. Please do not repeat testimony already given. Any written comments you have with you today should be summarized orally, but should not be read. I would now ask uh, Staff Counsel Ms. Gary Webb to offer opening comments. 
Thank you, Dr. Ganadev. As you stated, we did not receive any comments on these proposed regulations. However, we do have uh, one small change that, that is non-substantive, and that is under section 1379.04 related to training in infection control. We've identified the Center for Disease Control guidelines for infection control in healthcare personnel. We're going to specify that the, the operative guidelines right now are from 1998 and state that um, these guidelines are hereby incorporated by reference so that we clarify exactly the document we're talking about. Now I now will call on those persons who wish to testify concerning this proposed reg regulation. The first person who signed up to testify is Ms. Carrie Speron. Spare one. Thank you, Carrie. Any other public comment from people present in the room? Any comments on the phone? Sarah, do we have any comments on the line? If you do have a question. We have a comment. Okay. And if you do have a question, please press that and one. We have no questions, thank you. Please continue. Okay. <clears throat> Is there anyone else who wishes to testify? Oh, this is. Uh, since no one else wishes to speak, this hearing concerning midwife assistant is closed. The time now is? 918. 918 AM. Are there any questions or comments from board members? Is there a motion to approve the regulations as provided and request staff submit the regulatory package to the Office of the Administrative Law for finalization? So moved. May I make a suggestion? Yes. Okay. Um, can we, my suggested motion would be to um, uh, adopt the language with the proposed amendment to clarify the guidelines from the CDC and authorize staff to make any non-substantive changes that are needed to complete the rulemaking file and uh, submit it through the process to the Office of Administrative Law for a formal adoption. Dr. Lewis, are you? I accept that uh, proposed motion. Do we have a second? <clears throat> Ms. Toof, roll call, please. Oh, are there any comments from the audience? Any comments on the phone? Do we have any comments on the line? Are there any comments on the line? Yes, there are one. There are no questions. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Roll call, please. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Judge Feinstein? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Yip? Yes. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Thank you. Uh, that ends the agenda item 17. Next item is uh, 18, presenta presentation on medical school curriculum changes. I would love, like to ask Dr. Nation to come forward. Dr. Catherine Nation is the Associate Vice President for Health Services in the University of California Office of the President. In this capacity, she provides leadership and strategic directions to, for the UC 17 health sciences schools, including work with campus leaders and broad range of issues, including those related to educational policies, student fee, and uh, program planning. She represents UC Health Sciences programs internally and externally 
oversees development of enrollment plans and new programs and monitors state and federal health workforce data and proposed initiative impacting health sciences teaching program. A respected expert in health professions education, she was reappointed in 2013 by California Governor Jerry Brown as a member of the California Healthcare Workforce Policy Commission, a statewide body established to promote primary care training and workforce development. A longtime advocate for diversity in the health sciences, Dr. Nation was an early architect of the university's Innovative Prime Initiative which includes six unique programs in medical education that provide specialized training to prepare future graduates to help meet the needs of medically underserved groups and communities. These programs currently have approximately 350 students annually and maintain a level of diversity rarely seen in U.S. medical education. In addition to her leadership and advocacy on behalf of UC's Health Sciences Teaching Program, Dr. Nation manages and conveys a variety of UC and state leadership groups focusing on issues ranging from graduate medical education and state workforce priorities to UC system-wide clinical initiative to improve outcomes and quality of care. Dr. Nation completed her undergraduate education at UC Davis, earning honors in political science and public policy and Spanish, and earning her medical degree from UC San Francisco. Dr. Nation, please go ahead. Good morning, thank you. I, I really need to shorten that bio. It's, it's hard to sit through, but thank you very much. For uh, thanks the, for coming, we really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, so I was asked, I think, to spend a, about, I'll move this back a little bit, um, about 20 minutes this morning providing a fairly high-level overview of medical education um, in the state of California. And that's a fairly short time, time frame for a very big um, topic. So I'm going to begin, um, I have a little longer slide deck than I ordinarily would opt for um, because I was encouraged to put some numbers on paper that folks could refer back to. Um, and I'll certainly welcome questions at any point along the way. Um, so I'll begin with a little bit of context. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some specific numbers in terms of our medical student programs and or GME programs. And then I'll talk specifically, I think I was requested to address a little bit about what's new in medical education and to talk a little bit about hand how we um, address issues related to ethics and professionalism. So. Um, so to start, uh, so the context I think for us is that California has a relatively small medical education system in terms of medical student slots in the GME um, for a state with our population um, and our geography. So we're, we're a big state with a lot of people, with a lot of demand, and we're comparatively small. Um, on a per capita basis, we have um, a medical student enrollment that is the third, the lowest, third lowest in the nation among all states that have medical schools. So there are four states in the country that, without medical schools. Those are the whammy states, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. Um, but among states that do have medical schools, we, we sit ne near the bottom. Yeah? Um, so educational opportunity per capita. And that's by contrast to the median of 30.3 uh, slots um, per 100,000 population that you see. Um, so today in the current year, we have about 7,000 students enrolled in our now 12 um, medical schools. And that's a little bit of a jump from the number of medical schools this state historically had for many, many years. So taking a look at our medical schools here today, um, you see our public nonprofit uh, medical schools. Those are operated by the University of California. Um, where it's been my privilege to have a long tenure in partnership um, working with our schools, with our students, with our programs. Our medical schools, I think most folks know, are at Davis, Irvine, Los Angeles, Riverside, our newest, um, and I'll say a little bit more about um, Riverside in a, in a bit later, UC San Diego and UC San Francisco. We have three private um, allopathic, those are MD granting medical schools that are long standing Loma Linda, USC, and Stanford. We have a fourth newer um, medical school, North State University, which is private and for profit. And this is the first for profit allopathic medical school in the country. It's located in Sacramento. And then we have 
two private um, uh, osteopathic medical schools, one in Vallejo, that's Turo, and, and then the Western University of Health Sciences in Southern California. Um, I think also worth noting, but not shown on, on this slide, are plans by three additional entities to open new medical schools in the state. Um, within a very short timeline, the next uh, four to three to four years is the best information that I have. Um, these include Kaiser Permanente with plans for a new school opening, um, I see lots of smiles, um, in 2019, I think is their public date. Um, that'll be in Southern California and Pasadena. Um, there is the California University of Science and Medicine, um, which may have admitted its first class or next year, I think a class of 50, um, which is not for profit and also um, in Southern California in the Inland Empire. And then a third, um, California Health Services University, which has announced plans to open a for-profit medical school in the San Joaquin Valley. And this would be in some geographic proximity to the for-profit pharmacy school that's open. Uh, so um, UC just briefly, and I'll have a little more detail on, on UC because that's my, my day job. Um, but um, our system as a whole is among the, it's probably the largest in, it's not only the largest in the state, it's likely the largest in the nation in terms of health professions. Education might be among the largest uh, even internationally. So we have 17 health sciences schools. We have schools of dentistry, nursing, pharmacy, optometry, public health, um, veterinary medicine. Among our medical school programs, we um, have about 3,000 students currently enrolled um, and nearly half of the medical residents um, in the state. And I'll get into some of the detail about that. Um, but our medical students and residents are about two-thirds of all of our health professions programs within the state, and those are based on seven campuses. So to move now to graduate medical education, I think most here are aware of the fact that it is the ACGME, the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, that is nationally responsible for accrediting um, most GME programs. Currently, there are 27 um, ACGME programs that are recognized as first board specialty programs, and these lead to initial board eligibility and certification. Um, and there are roughly an additional 100 subspecialty um, programs that are recognized by the ACGME. And it's been a steady rate of rise in terms of the recognition of those specialties over time. So um, some numbers for, for California now. Um, for the 15-16 year, at least according to the ACGME site, um, there are 878 accredited training programs in, in the state. Um, that number will likely jump next year. Um, 375 of these are in first board programs, um, training about 80% of the residents in the state. Then a larger number, some 500 subspecialty training programs um, that train smaller numbers of subspecialists, with most of these concentrated at um, university medical centers. So UC does uh, a lot of this training. Stanford, Loma Linda, uh, USC do a substantial volume as well, as do some major academic medical centers that don't operate medical schools, such as Cedar sinai um, in, in California, the, the major sponsors, and there are many, um, so we've got 84 sponsoring institutions that the ACGME recognizes, um, but the biggest are um, UC, our, our schools, and our medical centers, the private California medical schools um, that I've mentioned, Kaiser Permanente in the north and the south has a major role and substantial presence in GME. Our children's hospitals offer pediatric training and pediatric subspecialty training. And then we've got a large number of smaller community-based um, programs, sometimes offering family medicine, sometimes a smaller number. So looking here at um, distribution, the, it's a little, maybe a little hard to read. The, um, the top half of the donut shows shows the distribution by campus for UC. So we've got some variability, bigger and uh, smaller campuses. Um, but in total, 
UC training programs uh, currently we enroll about 5,060 residents, so again, about half um, with the balance um, made up by the, in, by the individual sponsoring institutions that I've previously listed. In um, our own UC programs, and I don't have the specialty distribution um, for the private medical schools within the, um, within the state, I suspect that Sanford, Loma Linda, and SC um, are not substantially different than the University of California's uh, um, programs. But, but you'll see here we've got um, currently a bit over 5,000 residents uh, across UC. We have 20% in hospital-based subspecialties. These are subspecialties such as emergency medicine, anesthesiology, radiology, um, our hospitalist programs. Um, we've got another nearly 20, 19% in surgical specialties. Um, the other medical specialties at 25% include examples such as dermatology, psychiatry, medical genetics, and genomics. Primary care, of course, it includes family medicine, general internal medicine, pediatrics, and OBGYN is included in these numbers here. Um, so I guess a, 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 a point I enjoyed talking with groups about, um, particularly in national settings, so this is, this is a state um, setting, but the return on investment um, to the state of California for graduate medical education is an exceptionally high one. Um, by virtually any metric, um, we, we're small, um, but you can read various rankings in terms of um, our success, the success of our training programs in retaining um, the graduates that we produce. So um, you see that we rank first in the nation with highest retention rates. We're, we're nevertheless reliant on in-migration um, of our students who have to leave the state to attend medical school elsewhere a little bit bigger graduate medical education system than we have medical student slots so we can accommodate incoming students who've graduated from other medical schools. Um, we have an aging workforce. Um, we're a, a, an expensive place to live, but we do rely on in-migration um, and cannot possibly meet the demand of um, the talented students that we see in our applicant pool. Um, and you see within UC, I have um, the numbers, but um, overwhelmingly our UC students are California residents, um, particularly so at Davis, um, Riverside, Irvine, and San Diego. A few more out-of-state students at San Francisco and UCLA, just given the, um, <laughs> the stature of those schools, but also given their long history and, and who it is that we tend to compete for students with. But a, a long mission and commitment to, um, to admitting California students um, but not nearly um, as many spaces as we could um, possibly fill. So our, our challenges before I get to a couple of um, points about the curriculum, um, they are certainly fiscal challenges. Um, the persistent congressional threats to cut Medicare, um, which I think um, most here um, know of, we see these year in and year out. Um, we've seen very little investment by the state until recently, um, massive cuts in higher education that have had ramifications at least for our UC programs, for our medical, for our health professional programs. Um, rising debt is an incredible challenge for our graduates. Um, a little investment in recent years in terms of funds that um, have been provided to the California Work, Health Workforce Policy Commission. Um, and I'm familiar with those because I serve as a governor's appointee representing UC on that body. So we've had a little, a few, uh, a, a few more buckets of dollars for some funding on a one-time basis. It's not ongoing, which is a challenge, but for, for primary care training programs. Um, principal funding goes to family medicine by tradition and practice. Um, there's also funding that is um, under the jurisdiction of this commission for physician assistant and NP training programs, also for nursing programs. Um, and some potential um, room for additional money over a three-year um, period in the governor's budget that's contingent upon federal approval uh, of, a, of a hospital quality fee. So we're, we're waiting to learn um, whether those funds materialize. Um, so access to uh, GME training 
is a challenge, particularly in areas such as the Inland Empire, um, a challenge for Riverside um, access. We've got a longstanding presence at UCSF Fresno with many training programs, but clearly huge need out in our San Joaquin Valley. Um, and I think concerns by most of our program directors and other leaders in graduate medical education around the stresses of practice, the stresses of training, and, and concerns of, about how we support our house staff in terms of resident well-being. Um, now I'm going to switch back to um, a, a specific request that I, I highlight just a few, and I think time doesn't allow um, me to do justice to a number of the innovative programs that are developing um, in our medical schools across the country. I'm going to just select those from UC because those are were easy for me to access and they're programs I have um, a lot of familiarity with having helped either start um, or address issues or challenges connected with some. So, it, so at um, UC Davis um, there are a series of innovative tracks um, that are very attractive to students. Um, they have a new accelerated competency-based um, primary care, ACE primary care program, which is a six-year program for exceptionally qualified students who, who come in and complete essentially the medical school curriculum and move into primary care training, enabling them to complete um, medical school and a residency training program in family medicine. I believe, and I could turn to Dr. Nuovo, um, that plans are to expand those opportunities to general internal medicine and pediatrics. I think that's right in the not yes. distant future. So the, the plans initially started, but the, again, the emphasis is on primary care. Um, so this is a small program, but obviously um, extremely attractive to students to save a year of time and to save a year of fees. So these are students that come with prior experience. Um, they don't really get to skip a year. They get to miss summers, and they get to miss elective clerkships, and they work continuously, but motivated and, and um, well qualified. A lot of discussion nationally about how to um, move toward competency-based education to allow those students who have the competencies to move through at a more rapid pace to do so while recognizing that some students who may come from poor performing high schools or f with less science preparation, um, either the traditional four-year path or in some, some instances a bit longer time. Um, Prime is a, is a system-wide program um, focusing on needs of the medically underserved communities. Each of our UC campuses has a different area of focus. For Davis, this is um, rural communities. Um, so this is a track that seeks to recruit uh, students from rural California communities, um, give them additional instruction about the challenges that uh, rural communities face, a little additional work in telemedicine. Um, clinical clerkships in locations that are, um, that are relevant. The, the TEACH program is focused on an urban setting. UC Irvine, and I'm not, I don't want to look to someone about how I'm doing with time here. I have a couple minutes. Okay. Um, please let me know if we're, if we're getting into a time issue. So Irvine has um, a prime program that's not listed here, but its focus, you'll see the theme of these is on the Latino community. Um, so students are recruited who have an interest in future service uh, to underserved Latino communities. So there is outreach. There is a language assessment as part of the admissions um, process. There is um, additional instruction around disparities facing these communities. There is placement of these students in monolingual Spanish-speaking sites um, with Spanish-speaking attendings. Um, with, a, with, with the goal to string together best practices that we believe are predictive um, of students moving into these communities to serve in the future. Uh, there's no contract, there's no fine, uh, there's no penalty if students make a different choice, um, but we see um, so far, or we're 10 years in, um, students disproportionately um, following the path that they described as their dreams when they, when they entered our schools. So UCLA also has a, um, a prime program that is focused on leadership development and multilingual communities. Um, there, there is a lot of emphasis and request from our students in leadership and advocacy training. Um, those are part of our prime programs, but also part of special um, programs and new curricula. Um, 
Riverside, um, you know, I think folks know is the first new UC medical school, first allopathic medical school to open in the state of California in 40 years. Um, the school moved from preliminary accreditation to provisional accreditation in 2015. First three classes have 50 students um, per class. This year's fall class, um, UCR has approval to enroll 60 and we'll um, welcome those students, I think, in the next week, if, if not this week. Um, and they'll grad graduate their very first class um, in 2017 in the spring. And it has been a struggle, uh, not in terms of the demand for students and, and Riverside recruits from the Inland Empire. They've worked hard to to develop and fund mission-based scholarships to reduce the cost of attendance um, that will enable some of these students, if they return to practice, um, to have their medical school um, at least mandatory fees covered um, if they complete their residency training and come back to the Inland Empire to, um, to practice for a period of five years. San Diego um, also has a prime program that's focused on health equity. Many of our schools are increasing their emphasis in, in terms of global health. Um, and international health opportunities. Um, a lot of interest by our students in precision medicine and genomics. Um, and at UC San Francisco, since I've been touching on Prime, um, for each of our campuses has a focus on homelessness and the urban underserved. They are in the midst of a launch of a new curriculum um, that has a principal emphasis on reducing health disparities um, and emphasizing team-based training. Um, as overall themes, uh, I, I would say, and there's you know dozens of examples that I could highlight. I, I think schools are moving to integrate their curriculum in terms of lectures, small session with clinical instruction, um, increasing emphasis on active learning, um, much more around um, system science, uh, clear expectations around interprofessional education, um, which at least within the University of California give us some opportunities where our medical schools sit on campuses that have nursing schools or pharmacy schools or dental schools or others. Not all of our schools have the same array. Um, again, I mentioned uh, an increasing expectation by students uh, and I think a move nationally and certainly within this state to provide students with more instruction on leadership um, advocacy and professionalism. Um, Jamie, I won't say much more um, about this other than the return on the investment is a high one. Um, we could benefit by more graduate medical education in this state. Um, I hope that between the ballot initiative uh, that'll, uh, that includes some funding through the tobacco tax initiative and some potential that might come to the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development that this state may see more resources that could be put to good use. Um, last, last on there, and uh, I'll <coughs> nod to Dr. Bolat, is that we were fortunate to have the partnership of the medical board, um, not only in terms of reducing a barrier for our ACE PC students at Davis that provide a pathway to licensure, but also with the medical board and co-sponsoring legislation several years back um, to establish um, a, a very innovative highly successful um, UCLA International Medical Graduate Program. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of the program and to have been associated with it, but also wearing my commission hat each year as we see family medicine um, program directors come forward and seeking f funds. They talk to us about the graduates of this program. They talk about their good fortune in recruiting them to these programs, and they say that they wish there were um, more of these individuals <coughs> to fill particularly um, the family medicine programs that are in underserved areas that have had a difficult time attracting graduates um, to their program. So um, last on um, professionalism, these are my last couple of slides. Um, I was just asked to say a couple of words. It's a topic um, that is so important. Um, I, I think that we are all, um, very much focused on the need for schools and training programs to train and prepare compassionate, ethical, uh, professional physicians. Our own schools um, work across a continuum to do this. Um, so it begins prior to admissions in a look at letters. 
Um, it is part of the admissions process. Many of our schools use what's referred to as a um, mini uh, multi-interview process where there are stations for assessing um, various qualifications and competencies of our applicants for most of our schools that use an MMI format. There are dedicated sessions that look to assess this in a variety of different ways. Um, our schools have a curriculum around professionalism and ethics. Um, it varies a bit by school, but in place at all, at all locations. Um, students are continuously assessed by their peers, by their faculty, um, by uh, others in the learning environment in terms of their conduct um, and expectations. Um, they are graded and assessed um, based upon the attitudes and performance that they, um, that they show. There is intervention um, in terms of instruction and remediation that, that occurs when um, an issue of concern is brought um, to the attention of anyone within the school, right? So again, students can raise uh, issues or concerns about classmates, um, faculty can do this through, obser through observation. Staff in the clinical in environment can bring this to the attention of others, both again through written assessments of a student's performance, but also at times that call for intervention. Um, when ethical lapses um, occur or are noted, um, campuses um, have a variety of remediation um, efforts that are in place that involve counseling, um, articulation of expectations of improved behavior, um, documentation, um, there are leaves of absence that can be granted if there's a particular cause that some of this can be attributed to, and in the event that um, expected progress is not made, um, students are, you know, moved through a disciplinary process to dismissal if this is required. And then the details of the dismissal process vary a bit by campus, but, but we do dismiss students when we, when we see evidence of this. Um, so I think I'll close, this is my last slide, it, and I think it applies to medical student education, it applies to medical <laughs> resident education, it applies for our California programs, it applies nationally. Um, I think our medical education institutions are, are increasingly expected to focus on healthcare quality and outcomes. I think there is a, an increasingly high level of accountability institutionally that is expected. Uh, same for transparency. We, have, of course, see a revolution in terms of healthcare technologies. Um, we will see changes in terms of efforts to expand access through deployment of telehealth um, and the need then, therefore, for our training programs to keep pace. Um, we'll see new models of care emphasizing team-based training partly uh, to improve outcomes and to reduce costs, but also to really maximize the use of and skills of health professionals in other areas. And, and then I mentioned my own optimism that we may see some new level of funds for the state of California. Um, $40 million is included in Proposition 56, which is a tobacco tax initiative, um, which is on, on the ballot. Uh, the overwhelming um, tobacco tax revenues would be allocated to the state for various purposes related to the care of individuals who have tobacco-related diseases. Um, but, um, but, but that would be a, a, a small increment, but a big improvement for a state that has uh, had little new investment in a long time. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Nish, and I, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, concern is this, uh, because I'm pretty actively involved, as you know, in medical education and creating this brand new California University of Science and Medicine, and I was with it took us 12 years to get UC Riverside approved. And it, that was it, it took, I'm sorry. 12 years yeah. <laughs> of hard work to get the UCR approved. And I was on their advisory board and I worked with the chancellor quite a bit. Uh, what concerned us during that time was the last UC school created was in 1967, if I recall. That's about right. So, and three of them <laughs> in that narrow timeline. So it took 45 years to create another UC school, and we still have only 36% primary care at UC schools. And I looked at your numbers, you're only about 12 to 15% over the cap when the revenue-wise number of residency slots are the revenue you get. 
compared to many community places like my hospital, which is a county hospital for county of San Bernardino, we're 40% over cap. We expanded programs, so that's why I'm just wondering, if we don't do this, I think we are, uh, number one, losing talent. Number two, our kids are going all over the world, including there are 2,000 California kids in Car Caribbean alone. And if you go to schools like Chicago or New York, uh, about 30% of students are California students. So both undergrad, that is uh, the, uh, the medical school enrollment and also GME programs, I'm just wondering what, what the UC system will, will do to really increase both of these, where really take care of California uh, population. Well, so it's a, it, it's a good question, and I don't have a, I don't have a simple answer. So I, I think that there has been long recognition um, within the university um, of a rationale for expansion, right, based upon responsibilities under California's master plan, based upon population growth, based upon burgeoning numbers of graduating high school seniors and graduating uh, college students with an interest. Um, the practical reality is that this state has had a very long reliance on in-migration, um, and I think it's been a strategy at a state level to save resources. Right, if our students have to leave the state, um, but we bank on them returning for their families, um, for their communities, um, it saves uh, some resources in, in the short run. Um, so I've, I had the opportunity to lead a strategic, help lead a strategic planning effort um, probably about eight or 10 years ago before the devastating um, financial crisis that the state faced. And, and we did lay out a plan for growth in five professions. So medicine was among them, so I'll speak only to medicine, but we also addressed needs to expand enrollment in nursing and in pharmacy and in public health and in vet med. Um, we've since done some reassessment given the proliferation of for-profit um, schools in pharmacy and for-profit schools um, in nursing in this state, and I sh absolutely share your concerns about the number of California students in for-profit uh, accredited and particularly for-profit unaccredited uh, schools that are offshore. Right, devastating for these students who may have no, who, who may have monumental debt and no path back to the state for licensure. Um, so what we laid out at that time, um, but for which we had nothing but devastating budget cuts. So, I mean, it wasn't just UC, it was CSU and it was the community colleges. We, we all know th those bad budget years. In that time, the, um, the university's professional degree programs were disproportionately cut. So it wasn't just health professions, it was business, it was law, it was those that were perceived maybe as having graduates that have, had higher income potential. So what we saw, what we were required to do at that time was to raise fees. So we had a, 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 we had a time where um, going to medical school at UC for decades was about the same as being an undergraduate or being a law student. There was no additional fee on top of this. Um, now you see schools lead the nation in terms of the rate of rise of debt, um, and this is a function of the California economy and the cuts to the higher ed budgets. Um, so we were not in a position, although we had a plan, we said let's, let's grow our enrollment within our existing schools, within our existing infrastructure because it's faster and if you can put more students inside classrooms, um, you can do it more quickly. We also had the engagement of chancellors about where new infrastructure might be required, um, but not a lot of interest on the part of any of our campuses of enrolling a medical school class of 200. You have to, you have, to have sufficient faculty, you have to have sufficient space in laboratories. Um, and our schools were at that time 110 to about 160. Um, but interest on the part of all in some level of growth within existing infrastructure and a little that might have involved some new infrastructure. And we said, let's do this in a way that aligns with the social mission of the university. So our first effort was to call for enrollment growth through Prime. We were going to add about 10% increases, and it was a strategy for expanding access, but not funded. About a third of our 350 Prime slots receive any state support at all. The other two-thirds are not funded. So rather than close those programs, they got funded into state-funded enrollments, uh, different strategies by different campuses, but we have 350 students now enrolled 
across our prime initiative and a really a level of diversity that I think is not seen in medical education across the, the, the country, 65% UIM among our 350 prime students. And this is because we know medically underserved communities are disproportionately communities of color. Um, so our, you know, our rural prime students look like rural prime California. Um, but um, tremendous um, diversity within this class, but not supported um, in terms of state resources, most of it. We're just getting back on our feet. Um, but we said after rolling out enrollment for prime, we had to move forward with Riverside. And once Riverside got to steady state, we had to look at the Central Valley. Um, and, and that was a, a sort of a, a view in 2005 of a 2020 vision. And now here we are four years from that. We've got prime enrolled, and we've got Riverside started, um, but not at the pace or the size that we would have wished. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Dr. Lewis? Yes, I'd like to uh, change the topic. Okay. Going back to actually your last, probably your last slide, and that's <laughs> ethics. And what, what I don't see and what um, we talk amongst ourselves at, uh, at uh, panel meetings and, you know, our, one of our primary missions is protection of the public. And we see a lot of um, problems with uh, doctors not understanding how to keep your license. Um, they've worked so hard and you've put a lot of effort into getting them to a point where they have a medical license, which is probably, if they don't have that, they don't have really anything. And what I'd like to hear from you is that how do you um, teach them you know, how to keep your license and what were you thinking? Because that's the name of the course that should be, what were you thinking? Um, you know, you, you messed up. And that's where you should be focusing a lot of this effort in ethics, because to, prov to keep what is so, so valuable for them. But it, it doesn't seem to sink in. Um, well, I'll, let me highlight um, a few things, and I and, and I agree with your um, what in the world were you thinking observation, right? Um, and it, it it's something that we could say to any number of people in any profession, but given the investment, given the seriousness, um, given the stakes, um, given the consequences. The, the what were you thinking um, it, it is, a, is, a, is a fair question. Um, I think our schools are placing far more emphasis um, on this, beginning at an earlier stage in terms of this. I've got a few um, details, and you know, I don't know if Dr. Nuovo, who works in student affairs, wants to highlight Davis um, examples, but you know, for UCSF, it's a four-year curriculum. Um, many, course, many of our schools now have dedicated um, standalone um, bioethics courses, um, but there is increasing emphasis on professionalism, pre-screening during interviews, um, expectations from um, observers, again, not just faculty observers, but peer observers, staff observers, encouraged to identify um, examples of ethical lapses or unprofessional conduct. Um, there are assessment tools that are used as part of peer review, uh, um, and there um, are disciplinary procedures that are in place for all of our schools. They vary a bit in terms of what happens to whom, at what point, for what cause. Um, for UC Davis, um, and I, I'll have to point behind me, um, Dr. Mobo, if you, yeah, if you, if, is that fine if he wants to speak to Davis? You want an example? Yeah, if you can, if you brief. can make a brief comment, please, because we. Because I could, I could give you two bullets, and he could time say, "I've is got one that's very better." Tight, so. Very, yeah. I could talk for about five hours on this. I won't. <laughs> you got two minutes. <laughs> Fifteen years as associate dean of uh, graduate medical education. Four years as associate dean of student affairs. The person you need to come before this committee, if you're interested, is what were you thinking? Is Maxine Papadakis from UCSF. Maxine, Dr. Papadakis has done a substantial amount of work on exactly the question you're having. There's a subset of individuals who get into medical school 
who um, uh, of the uh, problems that they have is not learning the material, it's professionalism and ethics. And the key feature being the failure to remediate or change behavior based on feedback. Mm -hmm. This is the subset that medical schools need to identify and terminate. No ifs, ands, or buts. There is another subset that we can do uh, interventions on and help them see the light. In fact, I work with, and this is my last point on it, in that uh, uh, students and residents who get DUIs, I sit with each of them to find out what, you know, what happened, what were you thinking. And eventually, what, at first they're all embarrassed, but eventually they become the spokesperson for the institution to talk to their peers about what they did, the stupid mistake they made, and what it cost them the, uh, for, the, <laughs> that's a big piece of it, and how to ensure that the others understand the potential impacts for licensing. I'll leave my comments at that. Thank you, Dr. No. Uh, actually, uh, we appreciate you going to Dominican Republic. So, uh, <laughs> Dr. Hawkins, and then uh, Howard. Then also. Thank you very much, Dr. Nation. Uh, just briefly, so I've been in private practice for 30 years in Inglewood, California, and so this is a very, very important topic. And I'd like to talk to you uh, offline in the future about things like cultural competency and projected shortfalls and aging workforce and all that sort of stuff because they're big subjects. I did notice that you didn't have Charles Drew University on your MD granting schools. Is there a reason for that? Um, so I know and have been a long time partner advocate and friend to, to Charles Drew. I did not list them because the LCME Medical School for Charles Drew University is UCLA. Um, so Charles Drew does not grant the MD degree. It is the UCLA School of Medicine, but it is a long and important partnership. Riverside um, actually began with a partnership as well with UCLA being basic sciences at uh, Riverside, UCLA granting the MD the reverse um, for Charles Drew. Um, so I didn't list them. I didn't also list a number of other programs um, that are smaller in size and smaller in, in stature. Um, where there is an LCME medical school. We've got a program at UC Berkeley that's much smaller. It's a joint program, um, but that's the reason that it wasn't listed. I attempted to list the LCME schools that are authorized to grant the degree. Um, but I do know a lot about Charles Drew University um, through time and, and to the present, so. Okay, <clears throat> Howard. Thank you, Dr. Nation. Um, if we were to do root cause analyses of all of the problems that come before this board, we would probably discover that many of these problems existed before medical school or in medical school or in residency training. I think it would be of great benefit if you're amenable and if the board is amenable to try to establish some ongoing collaborative effort to help in ethical behavior screening and, and ethical uh, teaching in the medical school system uh, and I'm very selfish in suggesting this because really what I want you to do is to make our job easier. <laughs> well, and, I, and I think I could speak on behalf of um, our, our deans and our faculty and our dean's offices that if we, if, if we did a better job at this, um, and I think that Dr. Novo's suggestion about Dr. Papadakis, who has spent a career working on professionalism and physicianship issues that have now become um, a mainstay for many medical schools, um, it would make our jobs easier as well. Um, and as Dr. Novo pointed out, there are those students um, who can be remediated. There, there are those um, where renewed, redoubled efforts to assess and identify at the beginning and to dismiss and to terminate simply just need to, um, to, to be handled and managed. Um, so a huge, I think, would make all of our lives um, better if we had a perfect assurance that we could identify each student um, at any point in time b before we ever enrolled them. Thank you. Second, uh, Looking at your slide 10, where you talked about uh, wellness and um, I don't thank know. you, Dr. Nation. Uh, we, I, don't, I didn't number my slides. You want oh, me to go back? Well, one of the issues was <coughs> resident wellness that you, one of, the resi one of the issues that you highlighted as a concern moving forward or an emphasis moving forward. 
and I, I know that UCFS, UCSF has a mental wellness program, and I know that there have been studies about uh, students' access and their perceived barriers to, well, to programs uh, for mental health. And uh, I'd just like to hear what, what the UC system, at least, has been doing to provide better access to students uh, pre-residency and address some of the barriers that they feel that uh, accessing mental health may prevent them from gaining residency. Yeah, a, a huge, um, a huge topic, um, and, and I can't, I can't possibly do it justice. But I will say, for the nation as a whole, we have clearly a mental health crisis um, in higher ed as a whole. We have a higher ed um, crisis in terms of mental health services within the University of California. We have a crisis in terms of adequate. Um, access to mental health services. We have even, we've taken steps within UC um, with student support to actually increase, increase student services fees, which are going to um, create a pool of new revenue on an ongoing basis that um, will be used to expand the numbers of staff and the number of services. Um, even with those resources, we are having a hard time finding and identifying the personnel who would be qualified um, to provide these services. So clear shortages in terms of mental health providers in the state. I talk with friends and colleagues in the San Joaquin Valley, and they tell me that not at any price are they able to recruit and not within any geographic uh, uh, distance of reason. Are they confident in referring um, students or residents who may be within the region? And so I think we, we, we recognize, I, I participated in a, in a regional roundtable that was um, part of a national series, so um, focused on graduate medical education and, and some of the biggest concerns that um, individuals managing and supporting and leading GME programs in the country face and resident well-being um, is among the top of the list identified, I think, across the country and, and in the state. Um, so clearly a, a need for more services, clearly a need for more personnel, clearly an opportunity for greater investment. Um, we're taking some of those steps within UC, um, again, not funded by the state, um, but actually funded by a, by a student fee because students recognize the, the importance of this. Um, but even in this first year one, um, we've got a target in terms of hiring for our student health and counseling centers. And within our medical centers, um, you know, residents and students like privacy from their, uh, from their attending. So we attempt to um, provide a confidential pathway for resources. Um, but the resources are strained. Um, they're strained in our student health centers. They're strained, um, they're strained elsewhere. Um, but a huge area of a huge area of need. I appreciate the question. I wish I had a better answer uh, in terms of you know being able to say UC's hiring you know an additional 50 personnel at all of our campuses de um, dedicated to the to our undergraduates, graduates, house staff. Um, we actually have a plan and some resources to augment personnel, but we're even having a hard time recruiting those personnel with these resources. Thank you, Ms. Lawson. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. And actually, um, a little bit broader question on really the same topic of uh, physician wellness and well-being overall. To what extent are those subjects actually being integrated into the curriculum? And maybe a two-part question, what, to what extent are time management, the practicalities of a practice um, being integrated into to, uh, the curriculum as well at these medical schools? So. Um, I believe the issues, the importance of the topics that you've listed are well known, well recognized, um, and priority areas for discussion nationally um, within our schools, with our faculty, across our deans, in any setting that we get to. How, and there are increasingly um, expectations of our accrediting organizations about how we manage student services and student support, what services we offer, how we teach and prepare, how we integrate, um, how we intervene. 
Um, I, I do sometimes say that when you've seen one California medical school, you've seen one um, because practices, services, resources, decision making um, become local um, within an overall, within the overall expectations of general standards for medical education. Um, so it's being done in a variety of different ways. Um, I, I could um, prepare or we could consider a smaller panel at some time if it were of interest to the group um, where I have colleagues that, that could add some richness to the detail. Um, I you know, sort of prepared for a high level overview um, on a broad range of topics. Um, but I think there's a, a wealth of content that could be shared um, uh, across schools in terms of the importance of the issue. Last question, uh, Dr. Bishop. Okay. Uh, and Dr. Bollard, go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Nation, and thank you for working with us uh, back in 2004 when I was sitting where you were and we were presenting to the board where a couple of you were on there. So thank you regarding the international program. And I really love your insights and a couple of ideas, picking up from my colleagues on the well-being, but we see the epidemic of physician burnout and obviously Again, it could be a small panel, but would like your number one or two reasons why you think that's occurring. That's, that's the first question. And the second that I'm very concerned about, and I think we all are, is um, the potential for dilution in the educational environment where we have many, many more individuals um, for one patient or a group of patients. And that's just system-wide where we have this kind of squeezing out in some of the most vulnerable hospitals where we're, we, we're seeing um, opportunities where folks can pay for positions and we can't, and meaning we, the state. So would like your insights. Um, so I'll start with your last, um, your, your last question. And I, I, again, my friend and colleague, Dr. Nuovo, he'll, he'll know that we spend a lot of time within UC. Um, we talk about this with our graduate medical education leadership. We talk about it with our medical student leadership. Um, I, our office recently issued a commentary on changes in health professions education. Um, including those that are particularly concerning, right? So proliferation of clinical doctorates was named as, as one, for-profit schools was identified as another. The, the incredible impact of a crowded learning impact, uh, learning environment which you have named was identified as a major concern, um, particularly with for-profit entities coming in and attempting to buy out space where our longtime affiliated um, programs are facing financial need, um, a commitment to public universities, um, but a temptation, right? I mean, the pressures, I think, related to health reform and expanding access um, here in this state um, mean that uh, doctors are forced and pressured to see more, to do more, to do it faster, to move more people through a pipeline. Uh, that takes a toll on teaching. Um, we're placing more people in smaller environments in order to adjust to that reality. Mm -hmm. um, so it, I, we, there's no perfect strategy for it because the pressures are in small settings, they're in large settings, they're in community hospitals, they're in university hospitals. Um, university hospitals are seeing the same pressures to take cost out of care, um, but our community partners are seeing the same. Yes. Um, and the ramifications, I think, for learning are real, um, right? I mean, it, it's getting crowded, it's getting to be challenging to find places to, that are suitable and high quality to place our students. Um, you know, we're fortunate to have longstanding partners within UC, um, but the pressure is a very, very real one. And we also have experienced there, are, you know, and I think this is probably well known to many of um, you here today, of, you know, some of these for-profit and offshore schools coming to increasingly, you know, we, we've seen it on the East Coast for a decade but it's kind of like a tsunami moving west um, in terms of 
um, these institutions, students paying very, very high fees and paying very, very high fees with the expectation these California students have of wanting to come back to this state. So you take a, a needy hospital having trouble recruiting uh, residents and you offer a little bit of money to accommodate students and you create an incentive for that to happen. Um, I could be a devil's advocate and I could say if I'm that student, I might be very happy to get back into some program in California to, to be closer to home to do six weeks, to maybe audition for a spot even if it wasn't a top rank program. And if I'm that uh, county program, I might be happy to have some money and to increase the likelihood that I might attract a California resident. Um, but there, there get to be very real issues around the quality of instruction, the ethics that are involved, the perverse incentives that occur, um, and then the crowd. So um, it's a real phenomena, and, and I don't see an answer. I just see it spreading across academic medicine in the country. And it's a phenomena for other health pro professions programs as well. It's a, it's a problem for nursing. It's a problem for pharmacy. It's a problem um, in areas that require um, teaching where patients are involved, where you need supervision, you need time to teach, and teaching slows delivery of care down, right? And, and, and good teaching in high acuity patients slows it down more. Thank so. you. Then to your, um, why the burnout? We could probably go around the table and we, you know, if we didn't let anybody repeat, we'd have a list of, of 15. I think there are a lot of reasons um, for burnout. We're, I think um, the demands of our daily lives are, they just continually increase. We're plugged into our phones. We're expected to be available 24 hours a day for any number of things. We're looking to balance professional lives with personal lives. We're changing technologies that are easier for some to learn and harder for others to learn. Technologies aren't always working as effectively as they may and can you know, break down in some delay. Um, and then there are in intense pressures around productivity um, that really do interfere with time for teaching. Um, so I think we have a huge problem in terms, we've got a problem in terms of burnout of, uh, of physicians in the community, but we've got a huge problem in terms of burnout of our faculty and burnout of our house staff, um, which I think is, you know, the House of Medicine needs to take a careful um, step back and look at what it is that can be done um, to, to address this a little more systematically. I think there are programs and good examples in some places, but it's certainly a problem um, across the country and certainly a problem here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nation. So any public comment? Any comments on the phone? Oh, we have one public comment. Please come in. Identify yourself, please. Hi, I'm Carol Moss. I'm representing the public. The question I have is, are you addressing the fact of not only physician burnout, but when people come, when physicians come to the end of their career, or when they're even in the middle of their career, we are a patient safety organization that are talking to doctors that have lost their soul. They have dealt with environments that they didn't do anything about. They've dealt with healthcare facilities that are not focused on patient care. Have you ever considered including faith-based teaching within the curriculum? It's time that we begin to help these doctors help others and correct the problems that are taking place today that are correctable. Uh, thank you, Ms. Moss. And uh, Dr. Ganeshan, just if you can make it in less than two minutes, uh, we are way past the time limit. Thank um, you. No, and, I, and I, I, I can't answer the question, so I can answer the question in less than two minutes. Um, there is not an active discussion around the incorporation of faith based uh, a faith-based curriculum that I have particularly been a part of. Um, I think there is the awareness of um, the environmental stressors and the ramifications of not taking action um, and the need for better reporting systems and the need for greater transparency. Um, but again, these discussions occur really at a local level and so they're not um, discussions that I have personally been a part of within the University of California. Uh, can you? we, Ms. Moss? Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? Any comments on the phone? Do we have any comments on the line? Sarah, any comments on the line?
system is slow. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nation. We really appreciate you coming in. Okay, my pleasure. Good question from the oh. line of Genevieve oh, Please go ahead. Yes, good morning, board. Uh, this is Genevieve Clavron. Uh, I have been involved for the last few years with a group who is called Beyond Flexner, who is really looking at uh, all. Uh, Genevieve, we, we cannot, we can barely hear you, so I, I'm not sure what's going on there. Well, they are looking at all the curriculum of a medical school, and they are meeting every two years, and they are meeting this year in September in Miami, and the last two times, Can you hear me better now? Oh. It doesn't fairly. I'm closer. I'm closer to the microphone. If you could, um, one more try. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, you know, I've, I've been involved with a group named Beyond Flexner, where most of the dean of all the medical school in the United States are meeting, and like this year we are meeting in Miami to re-review the curriculum and. I have been impressed uh, how they are trying to deal with the issue. Uh, but I think a lot of work has to be done, and uh, you have some people who are never going to be, you know, qualified to be physicians. And I think if we did more triage when the people are in medical school, maybe we would not have so many bad apples, you know, later on. Uh, also, uh, some of the private schools are closing. And you mentioned um, Drew University, uh, the nursing school at Drew, who is called Merv Dameli uh, School of Nursing, is uh, supposed to be closed this year because of, you know, issues. And we have another one in Los Angeles closing also. So I think we have to look at the quality of the institution and the faculty. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll, I'll try and be brief because because I know maybe we're getting behind schedule. So um, I am familiar with the Beyond Flexner um, conference. I'm actually likely um, going to change my plans and, and attended. I attended the conference um, in New Mexico last year. Um, so the Beyond Flexner conference focuses on the social mission of medical schools, which has um, been a passion of mine from the start of, of my career. Um, I'm actually really very proud that the UC Prime Initiative has been nominated for institutional recognition for its alignment with social mission. So independent of the outcome of, of that, um, I am a believer of the social mission, particularly of public medical schools. And, and so this is a new conference series, um, but it, it brings together people who um, who focus their work, their teaching, their um, their programs on access, on disparities, on cultural competence, on on things like this. So, um, so yes, aware. I didn't hear a specific um, question beyond awareness of the conference, but yes, it's a good one. Um, and, and then in terms of in Charles, in terms of Charles Drew University, um, I am familiar with the with the history of the university. I'm his, familiar with the history of the medical education program. Um, the closure of, of the hospital, UC was a principal partner in working with the state and the county to reopen um, the hospital. Um, and I do um, stay in close contact and do a fair amount of work with the um, president, Dr. David Carlisle, and, and plans are underway for um, addressing the deficiencies and the challenges that the nursing program um, experienced and moving plans, to, you know, not only to address those, but to reestablish programs so that the school will succeed going forward. And I think that's the end of our time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nation. Any other public and the, uh, comment on the phone? Do we have any additional comments on the line? Ask a question, please press star and then one.
Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, we'll go to item number 19, discussion on possible action on the legislation and regulations. Ms. Samo. Good morning. Um, so please refer to your legislative packets in your tracker list. Um, on your tracker list, the bills in blue are bills we've already taken positions on, and even if amendments were made, they do not affect our position. So we do not need to discuss these at this time unless a board member um, would like to. The bills in pink are the board-sponsored bills, and the bills in green will require discussion and a possible position. Before I move on to the tracker bills, I would like to mention some bills that have died since our last meeting. AB 2507 Gordon, the telehealth access bill, died on the assembly appropriation suspense file. The two scope bills, SB 323 related to nurse practitioners and SB 622 related to optometrists both died in Assembly BMP committee. And SB 1033 Hill regarding patient notification for physicians on probation died on the Senate floor. So um, if no one has questions, I'll move on to the sponsored bill update. AB 2745, um, that's the board's cleanup sponsored bill. Um, this is the bill that would make clarifying changes to existing law, and I don't need to go over those really unless someone has a question. Um, this bill is moving along, no opposition. It will be heard in Senate appropriations on Monday. Um, and so I just found out actually that it's going to probably be on consent, so there's really no opposition. It's just sailing through, so that's a good thing. Um, SP 1039 Hill, this is the bill that included provisions to clarify that the Board of Podiatric Medicine is its own board and separate and completely apart from the medical board. Um, unfortunately, the Board of Podiatric Medicine provisions were taken out of that hill, but um, per Senator Hill, this issue will be addressed in the board's sunset next year. So if no one has questions, and the last bill, SB 1478, is the health omnibus bill, and this bill just um, deletes some outdated sections in the board's um, codes and the business and profession codes, and this bill is just moving along, no opposition, it's just an omnibus bill. So if there's no questions, I'll move on what, to the what first. What I would ask the members is if you have a question, please raise your hand, otherwise okay. uh, Jennifer will go like a freight train. So <laughs> go ahead. So move, move it along. <laughs> so the first bill in green is AB 1244 Gray, and we haven't heard this bill yet. This is a new bill for the board. So this bill would specify the circumstances in which a medical provider must be suspended from participating in the workers' compensation system. Upon suspension, the administrative director of the Division of Workers' Compensation must notify the relevant licensing, certification, or register bo registration board, which would include the medical board. This bill would require the director of the Department of Healthcare Services to notify Division of Workers' Compensation if a medical provider is suspended um, from the Medi-Cal program. So, um, this is um, really similar to right now, DHCS, Department of Healthcare Services, is already required to notify the medical board if they suspend one of their providers. This is basically the same, making it the same thing for um, providers participating in the Division of Workers' Compensation. Um, we'll ensure that the medical board is notified when a physician is suspended, which will help to ensure consumer protection. And it will also provide for communi communication between workers' compensation and Department of Healthcare Services, which will also help to protect consumers. And so for these reasons, staff is suggesting that the board take a support position on this bill. May I, I need a motion. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Any public comment? Any comment on the phone? Do we have any comments on the line? Do we have any comments on the line? We have no questions in queue at this time. Thank you. Okay, roll call, Ma'am Kim. Dr. Balat, abstain. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Judge Feinstein? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Abstain. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Ms. Dr. Yip? Aye. And Dr. Ghanadeb? Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Okay, moving on, AB 1306, Burke. Um, some of you may remember this bill from 2015. This is the bill that would remove physician supervision for certified nurse midwives. 
At that time, um, the bill was very broad, and the board um, took an opposed and less amended position because we wanted the bill to be set up more like the licensed midwife, the bill that removed physician supervision for licensed midwives. So there was an advisory council. You know, we wanted something similar to the midwifery advisory council. We wanted something similar to it clearly specifying what kind of patients the certified nurse midwife could take. And um, so, you know, they kind of went through some rounds of amendments in 2015, and then the legislative session died. Well, it's back alive again. And so they've taken significant um, amendments. They still subject certified nurse midwives to the anti-kickback and referral prohibitions. That was already in there. Um, now it does require the Board of Registered Nursing to create and appoint a Nurse Midwifery Advisory Committee, which is very similar to our Mid Midwifery Advisory Council. And it actually, one of the things that we wanted them to include was actually physicians on this council, and it does. It um, requires um, two qualified physicians, including an obstetrician that has experience working with nurse midwives, so that's a good thing, and it's one of the amendments we asked for. Um, this bill would also authorize a certified nurse midwife to manage a full range of primary gynecological and obstetric care services for women from adolescence to beyond menopause. Um, these services include but are not limited to primary health care, no, gynecologic and family planning services, preconception care during pregnancy, childbirth and postpartum, immediate care of the newborn, and treatment of male partners for sexually transmitted infections utilizing consultation, collaboration, or referral to appropriate levels of health care services. Um, that's a little bit expanded from what their, um, their range of services now. And um, one of the things that is um, kind of a substantial expansion is the primary health care. <coughs> so I'll leave it to, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more in my um, recommendation. Um, this bill actually specifies the settings that a CNM can practice without physician supervision. They're listed in the analysis, but it's, uh, it's for the most part, it's settings that are overseen by the Department of Public Health. So it's a licensed clinic, a licensed health facility, which includes a general acute care hospital, um, a skilled nursing facility, et cetera, a county medical facility, a medical group practice, um, a licensed alternative birth center, center um, a nursing corporation, or a home setting. So this bill would allow a CNM to em be employed in these settings. So the ban on the corporate practice isn't effective in, in this version of the bill. But it does specify that the entity shall not interfere with, control, or otherwise direct the professional judgment of the certified nurse midwife. Um, the ban on corporate practice of medicine, and some of you may know the history, this has been a big issue in this bill. So um, when it went through Assembly BMP, they actually made them include language to include the ban. And when it went over to Senate BMP on the other side, and this is why the bill kind of died out in 20, 2015, Senate BMP didn't want them to include the ban. And so it was kind of like a catch-22 because they had to take the amendments in the Assembly side, but when they got to the Senate, it couldn't move forward until those were taken out. So they were taken out. It's still going to be a question of, um, you know, they're not in session right now. The legislature has been on their summer break. But when they come back in August, you know, Assembly BMP could take this bill back and say, okay, you didn't, you took out the amendments we made you take. So that's kind of one of the, this bill's still kind of a work in progress. They're hoping to work it out on the break. I'm not sure if they've done that, but there is a chance this ban on corporate practice of medicine could still be an issue. So I just wanted to let you know that. Um, this bill is very similar to the licensed midwife bill where it specifies um, what kind of patients a certified nurse midwife can take. So this bill would only allow a certified nurse midwife to attend normal and low-risk pregnancy and childbirth in the home setting when all of the following conditions apply. So there can't be any pre-existing maternal disease or conditions creating risks beyond that of a normal low-risk pregnancy or birth. There has to be an absence of any disease arriving from or during the pregnancy, creating risk beyond that of a normal low-risk pregnancy or birth. And there can't be any prior um, cesarean delivery. And there has to be just a singleton fetus. There has to be cephalic presentation at the onset of labor. Um, and it can't be the gestational age of the fetus is greater than 3707 weeks and less than 4207. So it can't be premature. It can't be overdue. And then labor has to be um, spontaneous or induced in an outpatient setting. So if the potential certified merciful life client meets all of the above conditions, the one condition that has been an issue for us, as you probably remember with the licensed midwife, is the prior cesarean delivery. We've been trying to do regs to you know, say when they can take those clients. So this bill, knowing that the kind of issues that we've had with our regulations, they've um, created a separate clause for a client that has had a prior cesarean delivery. So if, if a client has, meets all the other requirements, but they've had a prior cesarean delivery, and the woman still wants to be a client of the certi certified nurse midwife, 
the, um, the requirement in this bill is that the certified nurse midwife shall provide the woman with referral for an examination by a physician trained in obstetrics and gynecology. The CNM may assist the woman in pregnancy and childbirth only if an examination occurs and based upon review of the client's medical file, the CNM determines that the risk factors presented by the woman's condition do not increase the woman's risk. This is the big difference. So in, in the licensed midwife, it's the physician that has to make that determination. That, that's been an issue because for a lot of reasons, but we haven't been able to come to terms with all the players or the stakeholders in the bill and it's a hard thing for the physician to take on kind of, I guess, that liability of saying that, they're, um, that they don't have any kind of risk. Even though it's not specifically related to a home setting, um, it is essentially related to the home setting. So that's the big difference in this bill. And I think what they're trying to do is get around the issues that we're having in our, with our um, regulations. Um, so this bill would also declare that the practice of nurse midwifery within a healthcare system provides for consultation, collaboration, or referral as indicated by the health status of the client and the resources of the medical, medical personnel available in the setting of care. Um, and it requires informed consent, preventive care, and early detection and referral of a complication to a physician. And it requires CNMs working in a hospital setting to collaboratively care for women with more complex health care needs. So as I mentioned, this bill has been significantly amended. It's taken a lot of our suggestions that we had before. I think there's um, still some, some outstanding issues. Um, number one, like we mentioned, it doesn't include the, the ban on the corporate practice of medicine, but it is, um, they're narrowed on what kind of settings they can work for. And most of those settings are already overseen by a regulatory entity. And in most cases, it's Department of Public Health. Um, this, this bill allows the CNM to make the determination regarding the risk factors for patients that have had a prior cesarean delivery. Um, you know, I kind of explained why they're doing that because of the issues. And the important thing to remember here is that the CNM would still be held to the standard of care. So if, if they say, okay, you know, we're going to let this person, and they actually have risk factors where they shouldn't have, they're still held to their licensing entity, the BRN, if they make a decision that's not within the appropriate standard of care. Um, let's see. And uh, this, this bill does include parameters on independent CNM practice, but like I said, it does expand the scope of a CNM to include primary health care as part of the services. Um, so we're suggesting that um, the board probably take an opposed and less amended, or, or our, change, our position change from opposed and less amended to neutral if amended, but this is really one that's the board's call. Like, how important do you think? I think the three things we need to think about is the CNM making the determination, the ban on the corporate practice of medicine, and changing the range to primary health care. Those are kind of the issues that I need the board to opine on, and do we want to be neutral if amended? Do we want to remain at opposed and less amended? So I think with that, um, I can open it up for discussion. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, actually, what I will do is I'll take discussion first and then take a motion, so please go ahead, Dr. Hawkins. So could you tell us about uh, scope of practice, what does primary care involve again? I may have missed that. Well, it just basically includes primary health care. So it doesn't define what primary health care involves, but it says basically the range before was really related to, for CNM was not, primary health care wasn't in there. So it was really like the, the you're caring for the, the mother and the child and, and you know, the, the, the prenatal yes. care to right. the, the child care, but primary health wasn't included in there. There's not a definition in the bill for primary health care. But I think um, how staff read it is that it's a broader range of services than just what a CNM can provide now. Right. Sounds like it. Any other comments? Okay. So our current position is opposed unless amended. So do we have a motion of either of the two? Also move opposed unless amended. Second. Okay. So we have a motion and second. Any discussion? Uh, Kim, go ahead, please. You know, this is when uh, Ms. Samoza and I have talked a lot about in reviewing the amendments. And in looking at it, the, one, the only amendment at this point that we really feel strongly about is that primary health care. And so we believe that you, um, our, our recommendation is that you would take a neutral if amended, and we'd only go neutral if they made that amendment to remove the primary health care out of the bill. So that, that would be our staff's recommendation. Um, oppose unless amended after they've made significant changes to it. Um, I don't know if, if that's the position that the board wants. It, it's completely up to the board, but that is just kind of my, my, my two cents on the matter, I guess. 
thank you, Ms. Koshmeyer. Uh, so one other point you mentioned, Ms. Simos, is that uh, corporate bar. So uh, what exactly is in the bill where the corporate bar is protected? Uh, we don't want the hospitals to be just hiring these people and uh, there, there is a real problem, so that's why I'm just trying to see what, what, what's going down. And one of the things that's been mentioned when, at, when I've been asked about this bill is, so what's in place for licensed midwives that don't have physician supervision? They don't have the ban on the corporate practice in medicine now, albeit they're probably not working in hospitals like CNMs are. But um, you know, we, when staff looked at it, the facilities, that, the settings that they're allowed to work on are actually regulated. Um, so. And there is that, um, you know, the provision that they can't, they can't, you know, have any effect or, in, or make, you know, what does it say? They can't affect the, um, the professional judgment of the certified nurse midwife. I mean, we weren't sure that that was a big of a deal since it actually limited the settings that they could work in, but that's, again, that's up to the board. Okay, so is there uh, Dr. Lewis, are you still ha have okay with your motion? Or do you I, at the moment, I'm still okay with the motion because if you oppose unless amended and they amend it, then it falls back to oppose, right? But well, then no. neutral, if falls back to neutral. It, then we're just not opposed anymore. And then well, I yeah, so I, I don't you. see the harm in leaving the motion as a Unless amendment. So the other thing I need to know before you guys vote on it is what actually amendments you're asking for. So are you okay with everything except for the primary health, or do you want the ban and, on the corporate practice? And clarify in the corporate bar. Corporate bar. Okay. Those okay. are the Those two. Those two. Those two. Okay. So do we still have a second? Second, second was. Yeah. Second. I'm just trying to see where the second was. Oh, Dr. Bolat. Dr. Bolat. Okay. Okay. Ms. Mm, Tooth? Oh, oh uh, I'm sorry. Uh, actually, let's take uh, public comment. Carrie Sparovan, licensed midwife. I'm not really sure how the language around prior cesarean sections for a home birth serves anybody. It looks like it requires the CNM to send the woman for a referral with the doctor, but then the CNM still is deciding whether or not that woman is eligible based on her risk factors for a home vaginal birth after a prior cesarean. So there's an additional burden put on the woman to pay for and obtain this consultation. There's a burden put on the physician to do the consultation when it's not his client or her client, and then it's still gonna ultimately result in the certified nurse midwife making a determination as to whether or not this particular woman's risk factors are such that she could still safely attempt a vaginal birth at home. So. I'm just kind of, it, it, the way it sits for licensed midwives right now is our legislation, AB 1308, did not specifically say we had to get a physician consultation for a prior cesarean delivery. That's what was going to be addressed in regulations, and it has turned out to be a huge sticking point for us getting those regulations passed but it wasn't dictated by the legislation that we had to have that consultation. And I'm just, I'm really questioning this, this language in the CNM bill as, as to whether it's gonna really help anybody. Um, particularly, is it gonna provide any additional safety for women, which is the charge of this board. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Any comment, uh, Ms. Simosa? You we, commented already. Yeah, on I mean, it, so. I commented already. That's why this bill has, is it, the <laughs> author of this bill is aware of the issues we're having with the regs, so that's why they're trying to specify it in law, and they're trying to also address the issue where the, the, physician, the physician groups have mentioned that no one's going to be willing to take the liability to say, okay, this patient is okay, so that's why they're, that's their thinking around putting it on making having the CM. Still requiring the exam, and the CNM would look at what is found in that exam and then make that determination, and then 
you know, um, their license would be on the line if they ma made a determination that wasn't within the standard of care. And I think from the licensee population of the, um, the OB-GYNs, I think the reason they would want them to go to a, a physician is at least then they would have education as to the risks of, of VBAC. And um, I think that's why the language is recommending that they go back to the physician consult, um, even though the CNM gets to make that final determination. And, and Dev, I, I would agree with Kim, and I think also it provides a second opinion from an individual who, who at least theoretically has more training and education um, in that specific field. So the patient has a second opinion, has a chance for education. And the, the certified nurse midwife also has a chance for perhaps finding out something they had not considered. It's a good consultation. Consultations are always good. I think it's much more protective. I think it's a, a good plan. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. Any other public comment? Any comments on the phone? Do we have any comments on the line? Sarah, any comments on the line? No questions. No questions. Thank you. Ms. Tuf, roll call. Dr. Volat? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Judge Feinstein? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krauss? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? No. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Carries. Mr. Moss, next. Okay, moving on, SB 482. Um, last last um, meeting, we actually took a support position on this bill, but it's been um, substantially amended, so we need to go over it again. So this is the bill that would require a prescriber to access and con consult the CURES database to review a patient's controlled substance history before prescribing a Schedule II, three, or four controlled substance for the first time, and four has actually been added before it was two or three, to that patient at least once every four months thereafter if the prescribed controlled substance remains part of the patient's treatment. This bill would require a health care pr practitioner to obtain a patient's controlled substance history from the CURES database no earlier than 24 hours before the medication is prescribed, ordered, administered, furnished, or dispensed. This bill would define first time to mean the initial occurrence in which a health care practitioner intends to prescribe, order, administer, furnish, or dispense a controlled substance to a patient and has not previously prescribed a controlled substance to that patient. So um, this has significantly um, expanded exemptions in this bill, and this is what we really need to go over to see the, you know, the, before the bill had some exemptions, but it was still a pretty strong bill in requiring physicians to check. So I just um, really need to go over the exemptions with you, and then we can see if we need to change our position or not. So um, this bill would specify that the requirement to consult the CURES database does not apply to a healthcare practitioner in any of the following circumstances. So if a healthcare practitioner prescribes, orders, or furnishes a controlled substance to be administered or dispensed to a patient while the patient is admitted to any of the following facilities or during an emergency transfer between any of the following facilities, and these include a licensed clinic, an outpatient setting, a health facility, and a county medical facility. Um, another exemption is when, a, uh, so in this circumstance, when a healthcare practitioner prescribes, orders, administers, furnishes, or dispenses a controlled substance in the emergency department of a general acute care hospital, if the quantity of the controlled substance does not as exceed a seven day supply, so they wouldn't have to check it in that circumstance. Um, if a healthcare practitioner prescribes, orders, administers, furnishes, or dispenses a controlled substance to, pa to a patient, as part of the patient's treatment for a surgical procedure, if the quantity of the controlled substance does not exceed a non-refillable five-day supply and is in a licensed clinic, an outpatient setting, a health facility, a county medical facility, or a place of practice. Um, if a healthcare practitioner prescribes, orders, administers, furnishes, or dispenses a controlled substance to a patient receiving hospice care. And if all the following circumstances are satisfied. So if if the, if the ones that I read right now are all satisfied, they don't have to check. So it is not reasonably possible for a healthcare practitioner to access the information in the CURES database in a timely manner. If another healthcare practitioner or designee authorized to access CURES is not reasonably available, and the quantity of a controlled substance does not exceed a non-refillable five-day supply. So if all those are met, those three, then they don't have to check CURES. Um, if the CURES database is not operational as determined by DOJ or when it cannot be accessed by a healthcare practitioner because of a temporary technological or electri electrical failure, 
healthcare pr practitioner shall, without undue delay, seek to correct any cause of the failure, failure that is reasonably within his or her control. So here we go. A lot of these words in here are hard for as a regulatory agency. It sounds like good from the output, but reasonably within his or her control. That's a hard one, you know, for a regulatory agency to kind of regulate. Um, if the CURES database cannot be accessed because of technological limitations that are not reasonably, again reasonably, within the control of the healthcare practitioner. Technological limitations isn't defined, so that's another one that's um, pretty hard. I mean, it's a pretty broad exemption. And the last one is kind of the broadest exemption, and it's if the CURES database cannot be accessed because of exceptional circumstances as demonstrated by the healthcare practitioner. Exceptional circumstances could cover a lot, and so be kind of up to, you know, as the board, as a regulatory agency, if we were looking into this, it would be, you know, it would be up to, was this exceptional? We kind of would have to make that determination. Um, if, if, if a healthcare practitioner falls under any of those reasons, they do have to document the reason they didn't consult cures in the patient's medical record. And then the bill would also specify if the healthcare practitioner knowingly fails to consult the CURES database, then they shall be referred to the appropriate, appropriate state professional licensing board solely for administrative sanctions as deemed appropriate. So the knowingly is another thing where it's a very hard that they knew that they, sh they should have checked it and they didn't. Um, and this bill would specify that it is not operative until six months after DOJ certifies that the CURES database is ready for statewide use, and that was in there before. So now we're kind of um, looking at our position. So we had a support position before, and of course the board believes CURES is a very important tool. It's an effective aid for physicians to use to prevent doctor shopping. And requiring all prescribers to consult the CURES system, we think that makes them, allows them to make an informed decision about their patient's care. Um, however, you know, like as I mentioned, this bill was amended and includes some, includes some really broad exemptions. Um, in addition, it makes it hard for us to take any administrative action with the word knowingly, and we can only take administrative sanctions. So um, board staff was suggesting that we change our support position to support if amended, with the amendments to, being to remove that. The, the biggest one that's an issue for staff is the exceptional circumstances, because that's really the hardest, it's the broadest one. Um, and so we would um, ask the author's office to remove the broad exemption and make changes, possibly taking that word knowingly out of the um, when we can take an action and it would just be the healthcare practitioner fails to consult the CURES database. Um, that's kind of, we picked the, the broadest ones and the ones that would be hardest for us to enforce. So I would need um, a motion to change our position from support to support uh, amended. So same thing, we'll, we'll discuss before we make a motion. This is an important bill. I, uh, major, many of the amendments you mentioned actually are common sense if it is post-surgery in the emergency room. I think the biggest trouble with the opioid abuse and uh, overdose is the chronic pain management. That's where the trouble is. So we shouldn't make it difficult for people to be, to put up with pain. So there is, a, the, so the, you have to balance it. But the uh, one you mentioned uh, knowingly and also the, uh, the one exceptional, uh, my, my thing is, is that exceptional defined by who? By medical board? I, I, I'm just curious where, where that exceptional is defined. So I would like to take a comment. Mike. I think that unfortunately those two words end up being the dueling experts like so many cases we see. And it comes down to it because I don't think any legislation can anticipate every possible circumstance. So you have to have some sort of word like that because there has to be some wiggle room because we can't anticipate every possibility. Yet it does increase the chance that, that maybe someone could get out of something when they, were know, when they were knowingly doing it but you couldn't get them on it. So it, it's a difficult balance and, and I, I guess I might defer to the judgment of our EO and, the, and our enforcement staff to say, what effect do they really practically think those words would be? Do you think it would be a terrible thing that would make cases go on for years, or would it require many more expert analyses, or would it be a fairly minor effect? I, I don't think I have the experience that you do that would help us determine how the seriousness of those words. Ms. Kirschmeyer. So from, I believe, both mine and, and um, our legal counsel's opinions, we believe that those words will cause a lot of problems with our cases, and we think it should be clarified. 
Okay. Any and, comment from And the everybody board? has due process. Sorry, we just want to that everybody has due process, so they'll be able to go through the process if we're going to take action, so they'll be able to bring up their concerns during that process. If I might just say what I said. So what you're saying is this would then put the burden of proof back on the respondent rather than the complainant, which is what, if, you, if it's knowingly, we kind of have the burden of proof that it wasn't knowingly. How do you prove that? Yes, so I think yeah, this appropriate, I think, puts the burden of proof on the respondent. Dr. Bola. I just wanted to make a comment. I, the concern I have is that when we start to chip away and we can't possibly know all the circumstances, so I'm just going to make this one statement about the fact about physician burnout. So I have a lot of colleagues that uh, have reasons that may you know, that, that only a seven-day supply here or there. And I do support that idea, but just to keep in mind for all of us that as busy primary care physicians that are going to see a lot of patients, and some of the times we have people that have pain, I think we have to kind of balance all of this out. So um, it's the chronic pain, but it can also be the acute. In the, in the, the emergency rooms do um, serve as primary care homes for many people. But in general, I do support the comments of my colleagues here on the board. Dr. Cross. Sometimes I fear that the enemy of good is better. Uh, and I really want this bill to pass in this legislative session. So I almost wish we could take a position of support but suggest amendments rather than support if amended. And I, and I think that it would be best for us to give Ms. Samoes some leeway to go to the authors to, to see if we can easily change the language without jeopardizing the passage of the bill, uh, and if so, to do that. And, and we, can, we can do that. I mean, that's what I'm going to be suggesting on another bill where we already have a support position that maybe just one amendment needs to be made and you give me an opportunity to work with the authors and the sponsors first. And if you know, if it's important enough and they don't make it, then maybe like an interim conference call or something is needed with the board. But um, I mean, I think we could do that. This author's office has been really open to working with us in the past. And so um, they know that we have some concerns with the broader stuff and they've, I mean, I don't think that we ne they'd necessarily be opposed, but they're working with a lot of different stakeholders that they're trying to, you know, get get to agreement on this. So that's definitely, we could continue to support, but I could, you know, meet with the author's office. That's definitely a possibility. Any other comments? Uh, actually, I agree with uh, Dr. Cross that uh, it's the beginning. Uh, remember, Medicare didn't start as one thing which covered everything. So this is uh, all PDMPs. Every, many states are struggling how to balance between uh, pain on one side and uh, opioid abuse on the other. So uh, any bill which takes us there uh, is better than no bill. <laughs> Let me put it that way, so that's what my feeling is. And eventually we get there where we want to go. That's the way legislature always works, as far as I know. So can we have a motion? Also, so move that we support with suggested amendments, is that Seem like the appropriate one. Everyone agrees that's the exceptional and the knowingly fails that I can bring up with the author's office. It's also yes. reasonable. Reasonable. Oh, um, well, I didn't know if you guys thought the reasonable thing was um, a big enough. We, the two ones that staff identified that were the biggest issues were the exceptional and the knowingly. Mm -hmm. okay. The reasonable is it's not, as, it's not as broad as the exceptional and the knowingly, though. We shouldn't be unreasonable. <laughs> So, do we have a second? Okay. Uh, public comment? Long, long door. Mr. Doe. Good morning. My name is Long Doe. I'm speaking on behalf of the California Medical Association. Uh, CMA's position on SB 482 currently is opposed unless amended. Um, you know, there, there are other issues with the bill that we were that we have problems with, but one of the issues in the bill that we do not have a problem with is the exemptions that have been discussed. Um, you know, our position is that the bill must avoid creating barriers to appropriate care for the many conditions treated by uh, schedules two through four, um, and and we think that the exemptions as they are drafted in SB 42 meet that balance. As as you all know, you know. 
there are so many regulations um, that can get in the way of appropriate medical care, and the one exemption that's being discussed now, the exceptional circumstances, uh, would cover you know the broad array of situations where where the bill c where a, a duty to consult could get in the way of necessary medical care. Now you know the what we're not clear about from the testimony today is, and from the staff's written analysis, the, the suggestion is to delete the exceptional circumstances exemption, but that doesn't seem to square with the comments that staff has made that there is some clarity needed over the word exemption, uh, or over the word exceptional, and, and you know, our position is that that certainly is not, I mean, that's a very clear word, and that's something that can be uh, teased out through enforcement and through other means, so I, I don't think it's necessary to delete the entire exemption, especially when that exemption serves such a useful function as as many members of the board recognize. So our our recommendation is for you to uh, reject any staff recommendation to suggest that that exception or that exemption be deleted. Um, that, that that's my comment. Thank you, Mr. Doe. My name is Faith Gibson. I'm a licensed midwife. I'm here with the California College of Midwives. And mine is just a comment about that the CURES program is a web-based, an internet-based program. And we all know what happens when our Wi-Fi doesn't work or our cell phone service doesn't work. And, and yet, somehow or another, that language doesn't seem to have made it into the bill that it may be more specific, you know, if you can't get online for longer than 30 minutes or things of that sort. I was actually listening to you guys on my cell phone on my way here, and first it dropped you several times, and then I couldn't get you at all. So it does happen. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments, Ms. Shamos, before I think, we... I think the comment that was just, um, it would be covered under... The Cures database cannot be accessed because of technological limitations. That basically covers anything that's not in the control of the healthcare practitioner. So I think the technological, I mean, and just to address the amazed comment, we're still going to be in support. Obviously, not always will the author take exactly what you're suggesting. So it's not like we would take the hard line and be like, oh, if you don't take that out, we're still in support. So, so I mean, I will always try to work with the authors. I just think exceptional and as demonstrated that is, it's pretty wide for the medical board to decide on what's exceptional. So I mean, I think what my plan as um, talking with the author's office is like, how can we work with this to make it a little bit um, easier for the board to implement or better for the board to implement when we're talking about if we were to have to enforce this. So that that's, I don't think that, I would take the hard line if you have to delete it. Or no, we, we're not even asking you. That's why it says suggested. So our goal is to get a bill passed. I, we can totally understand where CMA is coming from. They're advocacy organization. We're a regulatory body. So that's the difference. And we usually work together. So that's, that's another one. So, uh, so with that, Mr. Oh, telephone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any comments on the telephone? Yes, we do have a question from the line. Please go ahead. Do we have a comment on the line? And issue for the last 10 years, I have only one physician who have ordered my med, and I only went to one pharmacy. Then he questioned me as an opioid shopper. So, I mean, I think you need to teach them that how to use it appropriately. And I think people who are in chronic pain right now are not receiving treatment many times because the physician don't know what the cure system means and what to do with it. Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. Uh, roll call, please. Dr. Bolot? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Judge Feinstein? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Okay. So the next bill, SB 1174 McGuire, I'm not going to go over the whole <laughs> bill because we talked about it before. 
Um, we took a support of amended position on this bill, and this is the bill related to um, psychotropic medications and foster children and the data being provided to the board through the existing um, data usage agreement. So this bill would um, codify that data usage agreement, basically. In the last version of the bill, it was a lot more broad, and we kind of got promises that you know, the information that we requested through the data usage agreement would eventually be added, that we would, it would ensure that we have the existing information that we are, we got through that data usage agreement, but on an ongoing basis. And so that's what the board had asked for, is to essentially specify the actual points in the DUA in the bill, which they've done that. Um, so, you know, that was, our position was support for amended, but one of the things that the board asked for, and I believe it was Dr. Levine, um, was a sunset date, because she wanted to make sure that the board wouldn't continue to receive this information like ongoing if it wasn't helpful or useful to the board. Um, so the author and sponsor instead to, um, to basically address the, that board's concern it included language to allow the board to revise the data methodology every three years if needed. So their point with that is, okay, if the data that you're getting isn't working and it's not providing useful information, then the board can work with DHCS, Department of Healthcare Services, the Department of Social Services, and revise what data we're getting. Mm -hmm. And so that's the amendment they took to address that concern. So really right now, I need to take it back to you and um, say, is, is that language sufficient to meet that concern? And if so, we would change our position to support, but if not, we need to, I need to say no, that, that doesn't meet the concern and we really do need a sunset. So that's basically what I'm bringing you to the board is they took most of our amendments, but there's still that one remaining outlier. Okay, um, Jennifer, you went so fast. So what exactly is remaining? So that's what I'm just trying so to get. What's remaining is they, they re we requested that their, the bill include a sunset date. We didn't say how long the sunset date should be. We just requested that we, they put a sunset. sunset date, which basically would stop it if, if, if the data wasn't useful. And so what they did to address that concern instead is they put in a language that says we can look at the data methodology every three years and revise it if it's necessary. So not necessarily a sunset, but allowing us to look at that and saying this isn't helpful, but instead we'd like this data, or we want this, this um, information turned out into us because we think that would be more helpful. So they're allowing us to revise it, but they're not actually putting a sunset date. So now I have to bring it back to the board and, and say, does that address your concern of why you wanted a sunset date in there, allowing us to revise the data methodology? If so, our position would change to support, but if not, then I would need to go back to them and say, I took it to the board, but they still want a sunset date in there. Ms. Kushmeyer. And just a little bit of more clarification. Um, with this bill, it requires us to report to the legislature on our findings on a continuing basis every year. And I think Dr. Levine's concerns were that if we were going to have to be reporting this and everything, for us to just continue to do this on an ongoing basis going forward forever when the information wasn't useful or wasn't what we could use to identify individuals who are inappropriately prescribing, that there should be some type of sunset date on it. Um, I know, you know, we have concerns with it because we're not sure how useful the information is going to be because so far um, our expert hasn't been able to opine because there's just not enough information there that we're getting and we've just gotten the additional information we requested. But again, we're not sure how, um, what that information is going to be able to identify. And so that was, I think, Dr. Levine's concerns that we would be stuck having to report something when we're not getting the information we need. We understand what the author's office is trying to do and trying to say, well, maybe then you could get other useful information, but at the end of the day, we don't know if even revising it is going to provide us that information, and I think that's where Dr. Levine was coming from. So I'm, I'm gathering, uh, oh, thank you, Judge. <laughs> really appreciate you explaining to you a little. <laughs> well, the, this is a bill that I, I, I have some passion about. Um, and uh, and some concern about in terms of it, it, the data that is being collected. I understand the agreement is is a work in progress, um, and I I am relatively new to the board, and I would have jumped on board sooner to to perhaps help craft this, but. Um, my, my, my concerns are that the way the bill is currently written is, is not going to produce information that is going to be helpful 
in identifying those physicians who either shouldn't be prescribing psychotropic medication um, or who are abusing the right to prescribe psychotropic medication to children. Um, as I reiterated, it, as I iterated at a prior meeting, um, it, it, it um, I, you know, I, I do think this is a county responsibility that they're dumping on the medical board in, in a very strange, collecting a very strange amount uh, or, or um, uh, a, a, a very strange uh, compilation of, uh, of data. So I, I, I mean, I understand the purpose, I support the purpose, it's, it's it, 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 you know, but it's much more complicated of a situation that this leads one to believe. And I really feel strongly that it should sunset in three years because I have a sense that no one is going to be very satisfied with it and it's going to be more of a process of recrafting how we look at the topic than just what data we put in and what data gets spit out. I didn't know a better term of art to say it. So I, I feel very strongly that, there, that we oppose it unless there is a sunset. But I don't oppose the, the, the need to look at this area. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes. Ms. Suttonville. Was it an alternative to, to just have the term of our report sunset rather than the entire bill? I mean, we could, we could make that, that we could just sunset the data that's being collected to us. The report um, is really, what they're envisioning is going to be just part of our annual report. So where we, where we um, report like the enforcement statistics on how many actions we've taken on different, this would be a category. So it wouldn't necessarily be like its own standalone report. Um, but we could, and I think another thing that Dr. Levine was worried about, that staff would be continually having this workload of looking at data and hiring experts, and if we find out that it's not necessarily useful. Um, just a little bit on the sunset. So when I had originally told the, uh, the author's office, Senator McGuire's staff, about the sunset, um, I need to get some clarification on the amount of time, if that's an amendment we're going to ask for, because when I was talking to them, they were like talking 20 years. <laughs> and, we, <laughs> and we were saying, oh, that's a long time. When I brought up a lower number of years, their concern was, well, it takes a while. Like, it, let's say one of these, these, this data ends up like we're, our expert flags it. And then that essentially starts the complaint process, right? And, and it's going to take a little bit longer for foster children because we're going to have to go through the court process of obtaining the record. So it's not just like an easy sign off on like patient records like it is now. So these cases are going to take a little bit longer. So the three year, it may not be enough time for us to actually know if they result in any actions because it may, it could possibly take almost that amount of time just depending on, we've never gone through the court process of obtaining the records. So we're not sure how long that's going to take. So I don't know if maybe like, Five years would be a little bit more reasonable, allowing us to at least get through like the first year and see if it results in any um, action or any red flags. Um, the author's office, like I said, is looking at them, would, <laughs> would like us to entertain a much longer um, sunset date timeline, but that would just be my suggestion if we're thinking on the lower end, probably um, five would actually give us some time to see if any of these red flags result in disciplinary action against licensees. Can I just follow up? Yeah. Would the report include an opportunity to address the effectiveness of the data to say that this data, this set of data is not appropriate to, to having an effective report? Well, the effectiveness would really be to result in disciplinary action. So what you're looking at is the data is being provided to us, and it's like how many providers um, so, you know, prescribe um, a certain number, three or more psychotropic medications for a period of 90 days or more, and if so, we want all this information, and it's in your analysis. I can go over it, but it's in your analysis. And so out of that, our looking at the medications prescribed and the diagnosis and information, um, de-identified information about the the child, our expert is saying, okay, is there any red flags here that possibly the medical board should look into further? And if she does, or he or she does identify any of those, then we basically start the complaint process. So 
proving if this data is useful is number one, is there enough information for the expert to identify a red flag? And number two, if there is, did it actually result in any kind of disciplinary action taken against these providers? Because the big issue with this here is we don't receive complaints. So this is the whole impetus for the bill is we don't get complaints on this population of foster children. And so we're looking at this, the purpose of this bill is to look at other avenues as for us to get information on this population that we're not receiving complaints about. And this should, so yeah. understanding that, that the first, your first prong, number one, is there sufficient information for us to assess? Yes. To the extent we're not receiving sufficient information to assess, is there enough leeway in our reporting process to say this is insufficient and we need to go back and, and receive different, different information or more information or get the information in another way? I mean, it's not written in the bill that way right now. We could report that, but the way the bill's written, we would continue to receive it. So I think that was the point of the sunset. Are you, and does it, it uh, kind of sounds like you're Jennifer, suggesting that we... Uh, let me ask Ms. Webb to give us a comment on, please. Yeah, I, I really uh, would encourage the members to suggest a short sunset date because even though it will take time to go through the court process to get the records, we don't even know if we'll be able to identify practitioners that should be looked at more closely based on the data that we're getting. So far, it has not uh, been helpful to be able to identify physicians who should have a closer look. And so that short sunset date won't mean that it will have to end if we feel like we're making progress, but at least we won't continue to get these data dumps that we're trying to determine what to do with it. Okay. To the chair, Judge may Feinstein. I ask a follow-up question? Please. Here's my question. When you say the court process, um, I'm not sure if you're referring to the confidentiality of the record, medical records or other records of foster children. Is that what you're referring to, Get, um, gaining access to those records? The medical records. And so because the foster, um, this is what we've been told by Department of Social Services, because the foster parents are not the custodian of those records, of the medical records, that we would have to go through some, some court process. And I'm not totally familiar, maybe Carrie or Kim can help me out here, what court process it is, but we would have to go to court to get, get um, authorization to have access to the medical records of the foster child. Ms. Karshma, do you have a Well, second follow-up question? Hey, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the de but the department, the county department of social services or human services, whatever it's called and whatever county you're talking about, has those records. And... Mm -hmm. You know, I'm wondering if an artificial obstacle isn't being created to getting the records. A bill can authorize the release of the records, and that might be a simpler way to get the information than to have, I'm not sure, sure who the petitioner would be, but the Department of Social Services, let's just call them that generally, um, shouldn't be foisting the burden of going to all these different courts because everybody, everybody that's in foster care is the dependent of a particular county and seeking medical records. First of all, you're going to have to seek them on every dependent in the county to find out which ones are, are being prescribed psychotropic medication, whereas the uh, you know, assigned social worker or child welfare worker or county department will be, should be able to know that. And that's gonna be huge on workload on, on staff if the medical board is expected to do that. So we're, we're not expected to do that. What we're doing is we have the de-identified patient information for the child um, in the reports that we're getting. So that information is coming over. So once our expert identifies that this child, we believe that this child is being inappropriately prescribed to, 
Once that is identified, that's when we have to go back through the court process to obtain those re medical records because the medical board does not have the authority in any statute right now to just be able to gather medical records. We have to have patient authorization or next of kin or guardian um, authorization to get any medical records in the state. We can't just go capture those medical records. So that's what we're running into. We would have to get whoever the guardian is, and in this case, and these children, from what we've been told, it's the state um, who is the guardian of that, or maybe the county is what you're saying. The county owns those medical records for that child. So we'd have to go through the court process to petition to get those medical records. Maybe that's something as far as changing the law to allow us to see those medical records. That might be something we can talk to Senator McGuire's office for maybe a bill next year to, to show how e you know an a easier path for us to be able to investigate these cases. I think that we should keep that separate and we can take that for discussion for him to him on the issue. And the, the one thing I do have to say is I, I, we don't want to oppose this bill because of we're getting the data. We don't want anything to not let us get the information. I think our biggest concern is we don't want to continue to get information that's going to take a lot of staff time to do if it's not something that's valuable. And that's where we're in a limbo land right now where we don't know how valuable it is because we haven't gotten all of the information. We just got it on June 13th and our expert hasn't come back and identified anybody yet because she has isn't done with her review. Does that make sense? Kind of answer your question. Yes, but I think if you're looking at a 10 or 20 year sunset, you're looking at 10 or 20 years of a lot of right. worthless information, workload <laughs> yeah. that isn't necessarily going to get you get to really what the core issue right. is Right, and that's here. why we are, in, you know, we were in agreement with the lower, and that's what we would go back, and we've, we've talked to them about that, a lower, definitely a, a less, sun, lower sunset date than 20 years, definitely. I mean, you know, I don't know if it would be three or if it would be five, but it has to be on the lower end because otherwise we will have a lot of information that mm -hmm. it, it, if it's not valuable, that we'll be stuck with at that point, so. Okay, so it sounds like by listening to discussion that uh, keeping the position what we have that is supportive amended, including sunset in three years if you can, if not maximum five. Is that sound right to, to everyone? Okay, can we have a motion to that effect? Okay, Dr. Lewis. I will so move. <laughs> we have a second? Second. Okay. Any public comment? Any comments on the phone? Do we have any comments on the line? Okay. Roll call, please. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Judge Feinstein? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Ms. Lawson? Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Sutton-Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Okay, no, we agree. Okay, um, the next bill, SB 1177, I'm not gonna go through over the whole thing because we've talked about this last time. We took a support position on this bill. This is the bill that would authorize the establishment of a physician health and wellness program within the board. Um, it would be administered by a third party, administrative entity. Um, mm -hmm. This bill has been amended several times, but the amendments have been to try to make this bill stronger and more in compliance with the uniform standards to, um, to, to you know, basically um, address the opposition's concerns. The board was in support before. But one thing I do want to bring to your attention is that um, after the testimony by the opposition at the last board me meeting, a board member um, actually requested staff to do a legal review of the provisions in the bill to make sure that it actually complied with the uniform standards and to kind of look at the points raised by the opposition and the uniform standards and compare it to the bill and make sure that it was actually in compliance because that's what our position is based on, that it complies with the uniform standards. So I just wanted to report back on that legal review. So. Um, you know, Ms. Ms. Dobbs and Ms. Webb did a legal review, and um, it was found that a clarifying amendment may be needed in, in a portion of this bill, which is 2340.6C. 
and that just to make it clear that confidentiality shall not apply if a physician is not in compliance with the conditions and procedures in the agreement or if they withdraw from the program. So in other areas of the bill, it does state this, but in this particular section in C, basically says notwithstanding any other um, rule, law or provision of law, so it basically kind of wipes out what the other provisions say, and so we really need to be consistent in the bill and ensure that that C actually is consistent with the other, basically says, so right now, if this amendment isn't made, um, our legal uh, staff doesn't believe that it would necessarily comply with the uniform standards. So basically what we need in that C, we need to, it says, um, and I'll just read it to you, any oral or written information reported to the board shall remain confidential and shall not constitute a waiver of any existing evidentiary privileges under any other provision of, or rule of law. However, confidentiality regarding the physician and surgeon's participation in the program and related records shall not apply if the board has referred a participant as a condition of probation. We think it needs to be added to that because that's not the only circumstance in which we should find out is or if the physician and surgeon withdraws or is not in compliance with the conditions and procedures in the agreement. Those two clauses are added to the subdivision before that and they, they basically lay that out but because it says um, any ex under any provision or rule of law it kind of wipes the other stuff in the bill out. And Carrie can go into it a little bit more. So we really believe that technical amendment is needed just to make it consistent and clear that this, um, this bill does comply with the uniform standards. Um, I've sent this to the sponsors. Um, they're, they're having their legal look at it. Um, so we're kind of, you know, I'm suggesting that we still remain support on this bill. And then kind of like the other bill that you allowed me to work with the authors and the sponsors to get this technical amendment in place. Like I told the sponsors, it doesn't have to be this exact language. But you know what we're trying to get to. We want to make sure that our support position is based on that it complies with the uniform standards. And we want to make sure that it actually complies. And our legal believes that this amendment is needed or an another amendment that gets to the same goal. And so that's kind of what I've left, you know, not like this is the only language we can take, but we need to make it something that's clear that, you know, the compliance with the uniform standards is there. So I just wanted to make the board aware of that and make sure you guys were okay with staying support and letting, allowing me to work with the author and the sponsors. Ms. Webb, do you have any comments? No, I, th I think Jennifer did a good job addressing the issues and, and there's other sections in there that uh, we can address through regulations, but this is the, the one I think is important that we clarify. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Moss, you're suggesting to leave, leave support and you are working with the author. Is, am I correct? The author and the sponsors, yeah. Okay. So, can we have a motion to that effect? I move to support Senate Bill 1177. Keep the support, yeah. Sec so, we have any comments from the board members? I'm, I'm sorry that that motion supports um, with the understanding that that's yeah, correct. That she's working, going to work with the authors. Okay. That's I just want to make sure that clear that that's part yeah. of yeah, the motion. Yeah, support with recommendation that Ms. Samoes work with the authors regarding our suggestions. Um, any comments from board members? Was there a second? Yeah, yeah there was. Uh, so any public comments? First one I have is Long Doe, CMA. Good morning again. Uh, and again, my name is Long Doe. I'm speaking on behalf of the California Medical Association. CMA is the sponsor on this very important bill. And uh, we very much appreciate the board's support position. Um, we also appreciate staff's recognition that the concerns that remain are technical in nature. And uh, we, we have received the suggested language from staff. We believe, though, that uh, the amendments that CMA has already taken from the opposing side do address staff's concern, but we appreciate that, you know, there still remain the concerns, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to address uh, staff's concerns over any technical issues with the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Doe. Uh, next one is Carol Moss. Carol, where are you? Oh yeah, I'll uh, I'll wait for Carol. So Bridget Graham. Okay. Good morning. 
Uh, my name is Bridget fogarty Grammy, and I'm the Assistant Director at the Center for Public Interest Law. For the new members of the board, CPIL is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, academic, and advocacy organization based at the University of San Diego School of Law. CPIL has a long history of working with this board and monitoring this board, and CPIL's Administrative Director, Julianne D'Angelo Felmuth, um, was previously served as the Enforcement Monitor for this board and did so for two years. Um, several pieces of reform legislation have been enacted and mirrors many of CPIL's recommendations. You may recall that Julie testified before you last board meeting, reminding you of the board's terrible track record of overseeing the diversion program in the past. It failed five audits before your predecessors uh, unanimously voted to terminate the program. Uh, CPIL continues to oppose SB 1177 because we just do not think that it is necessary. Um, Frankly, we, we believe that a, a substance abusing physician who is having problems and if they really want to be reformed is not going to seek um, assistance from the board that is going to take their license away um, and seek monitoring and drug testing from that board. Uh, in the October of 2015, this board adopted elements that a physician health program must include if the board would support it. And, um, we really appreciate staff's ability to go through and do a legal analysis, and we definitely support the staff's suggested amendment. Um, however, we really do believe there are additional concerns, and we do not believe that, uh, that the 1177 does comply with all of your elements and your required elements. Um, first, you insisted that any program must comply with the uniform standards, as Ms. Samos talked about. Um, while the bill purports to do so, it still includes several provisions that are inconsistent with those standards, and it creates a lot of confusion in a program that is supposed to be protecting patients from substance abusing doctors. And this program demands zero tolerance for confusion. You have to make absolutely certain that the uniform standards apply. For example, this bill still makes special considerations for physicians who self-refer into the program. This is inconsistent with the uniform standards which apply to all program participants. The uniform standards do not have any kind of exception for self-referrals. Um, and no other DCA Healing Arts Board with a diversion program treats self-referrals differently than any other kind of participants. Doctors should not be treated any differently. Another element this board insisted on is the board's enforcement process will be followed regardless of the program participation. But as it's currently written, SB 1177 inhibits the board from pursuing its enforcement process by limiting the evidence that it may use in a disciplinary matter. For example, if the board orders a doctor to participate in this program as a condition of probation, it would then be unable to use the evidence of a failed drug test and a petition to revoke probation, and that is just unacceptable. Your paramount priority is patient protection. We urge you to take a much closer look at this bill. You must be positive that this bill is delivering what you demanded last October, and you should oppose it unless it's amended to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Grammy. Did uh, Carol come back? I don't think any so. Other, any other comment, public comment here? Any comments on the phone? There are no comments on the phone. Please go ahead. Thank you. Ms. Tuf. Dr. Bolot, aye. <clears throat> Dr. Bishop, aye. Judge Feinstein, aye. Dr. Hawkins, abstain. Dr. Krause, aye. Ms. Lawson, aye. Dr. Lewis, aye. Ms. Sutton Wills, yes. Mr. Warmoth? Abstain. Dr. Yip? Abstain. And Dr. Gonadev? Aye. What happened? 7 4. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so moving on to agenda item 19B. 19B. Mm -hmm. Which is in your board packets under tab 19. And this is related to federal legislation regarding the enhancement of the use of telehealth services in the military health system. And there's a actual copy of the bill S2943 in your packets. So this bill would, for the purposes of reimbursement, licensure, and professional liability, redefine the practice of medicine for providers serving veterans as occurring at the location of the provider rather than the location of the patient. 
The board has always believed that the practice of medicine occurs where the patient is located rather than where the provider is located. This patient-centered model is the nation nationwide standard that ensures that state medical boards have the legal capacity and practical capability to regulate physicians treating patients within the borders of their state. The board has previously opposed similar legislation and written letters to Congress expressing the board's opposition. So board staff is requesting approval from the board to again write letters expressing the board's opposition and concern regarding this congressional bill. I need a motion. This is, uh, at least in my mind, it's my opinion, but uh, it's motherhood and apple pie. It's where patient is, the doctor should be licensed, not we shouldn't be uh, being treated by by telehealth, by a person in New York or Montana. I mean, there is no consumer uh, protection, period. So that's, that's, what, that's why we oppose. So any comments from uh, members? If not, can we have a motion to oppose and write letters? Is that what you're asking, Jennifer? Yes. Do you want me to go? Yeah, there you go. Okay. I'll Dr. Second. Cross, yeah, and Dr. Lewis second. Any? Comments from the board? Any public comment? Any comments on the phone? No comments on the phone. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Roll call, please. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Judge Feinstein? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krauss? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Yip? Yes. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay, I don't actually have anything for 19C, so moving on, 19D is the status of regulatory actions. That's also in your board packets. So um, if any members have questions on the matrix, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, that concludes. Mr. Moss left you alone on that one, so any questions? Uh, Dr. Cross. Mr. Moss, you amaze me. Uh, so, so thank you for the excellent work you have been doing on behalf of the board. Uh, you're one person who's doing a lot. You're, you're like an army of advocacy. Uh, and I know that Kim and staff help you, uh, but uh, you have been an exceptional voice representing the board and moreover representing the people of California. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's a ditto from the entire board, Jennifer. So any other comments? Any public comment? Any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Summer. Moving on to item number 20, presentation and possible action on the University of Ibero Americana, UNIBI, Medical School Application, Dr. Nuovo, Dr. Lewis, Mr. Warden, Ms. Dobbs. So it will be Mr. Warden and Dr. Nuo. I do, I do want to again thank you for uh, going to Dominican Republic for uh, three days only and uh, working hard and coming back without even taking a vacation, so. Okay. Um, <laughs> we're here to um, look at the Universidad Iberoamericana School of Medicine, which I'll shorten to UNABAY. <laughs> And um, at the October meeting, the board approved a, um, a site visit to the school. And the site visit team consisted of myself, Dr. Lewis, Ms. Dobbs, and Dr. Nuovo. All the site visit team's members put input into the site visit reports. And the site visit reports begin on page BRD 20-1, which is my report and Dr. Nuovo's report begins on pages BRD 20-3 through 13 and then we have Dr. Nuovo's PowerPoint slides which are start on page um, BRD 20 through 14. Today we are also have two representatives from UNIBAY, Dr. Marcos Nunez who is the Dean of the Medical School and Dr. Lorraine Amel who is Dean of International Affairs are here today to answer any questions the board may have of them. And I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Nuovo. Okay, thank you. I'm Jim Nuovo. I'm the Associate Dean of Graduate Medical Education at UC Davis. Uh, the goal of this PowerPoint presentation, uh, there are some members of the board who have accompanied uh, uh, me uh, to uh, previous site visits, but for those who haven't, I think it's important to give you a sense of what it's really like 
to do a site visit. This is not a holiday. This is really hard work. And it requires that the school um, do a great deal of background work in uh, getting all the uh, documents together and organizing the right people for us to talk to and for the team and the support for the team to be prepared. What's interesting is uh, some of your questions that you brought forward uh, to Dr. Uh, Nation. I think you'll see some overlap in some of the questions that you've had uh, to her and what's going on in uh, uh, California training and how uh, this particular school is addressing those specific issues. I do want to thank uh, all the members of the team and the support people uh, who uh, put, helped put all of this together, including those members from the school. Uh, this is hard to do, and I think uh, everybody did an outstanding job. Um, and again, this is more like a travelogue, and you have the report, but I'm going to go through in a thumbnail sketch of what it was like, who we met, how many people we met, how much time uh, we were engaged in understanding what was going on in the school. So you arrive uh, at the airport and you get to work right away. And uh, on the center of the screen is uh, uh, Dean uh, Marcos Nunez. He may, uh, uh, he's here today. Uh, and some senior leadership from the school. And uh, really, that particular session starts with talking about the governance, educational objectives, uh, administrative uh, uh, opportunities, the admission and promotion standards, curriculum, education resources, and a corrective action plan. Um, and then uh, Dr. Uh, Nunez was kind enough to give us sort of a, a brief presentation about some of the issues faced in the Dominican Republic. I don't, does this thing have a, uh, yes it does. So we were uh, sort of out over here, I think is probably, uh, it's not the, the best description, but we were out somewhere over here on the island. And by the way, uh, this was the, we learned that this was the national dish called the Dominican flag, rice, um, some beans and uh, some chicken. And uh, anyways, that was uh, uh, just some of the cultural things that you learn. The next uh, individual that we spoke to was um, uh, Dr. Julio Castanos, the chancellor and former dean of the uh, school. And again, uh, and with also with some uh, senior leadership. And probably the most important uh, thing about that was that he was able to give us the background of a strategic initiative that came on in roughly 2006 and how that led to the curricular change in 2009, which if the board uh, decides to uh, recommend recognition, uh, that is key in terms of trying to sort out what it, when it would be retroactive to. So uh, um, uh, the chancellor gave us the opportunity to understand things such as that. Then we engaged in a series of meetings with faculty and with students. And this was, there was a great deal of effort doing it to make sure we had enough time to have conversations. And we did this in sequence. We did this first with the uh, uh, basic science faculty from the first and second years of medical school. And uh, uh, also tried to get an understanding with this group of how the school prepares its students for the clinical years. What specific activities do they do to get the students ready when they start their clerkships? And how do they integrate the basic science information with the clinical science information? So we spent a fair amount of time with that. Uh, and then we met uh, um, with the uh, uh, clinical science faculty this was the uh, pediatric faculty. We spent, I believe it was about an hour, an hour and 20 minutes, something like that, talking with each of these different faculty groups. And the kind of things that we talked about was just getting a general sense of how the service functions, the resources they have to train students, uh, uh, the role of the attending, goals and objectives, ensuring how does the school ensure the goals and objectives are met, how students are informed about the expectations for their performance, how they're monitored, what do they do under the circumstances that the student is not meeting the educational objectives, um, and a forum 
to ensure that there's a feedback loop to the school about the students and about the curriculum. Um, so a great deal of time was spent with faculty. These were the pediatric faculty, and then we had the surgery faculty. Uh, we also talked about issues about how they train in professionalism. And uh, uh, I think a memorable quote from one of the surgical faculty was, we teach them discipline of being a physician. And I think the theme was, heaven help any student who's five minutes late for showing up to an operative procedure on time. They just didn't get the chance to participate. But they also talked about the importance, uh, and, and I think this was a general theme of all the faculty, of emphasizing the humanity of, of taking care of the population that they were responsible for. And I was, uh, I was appreciative and grateful, and I was convinced that that was a key element of their uh, uh, um, uh, curriculum. This was the OBGYN faculty. One of the things we learned here from the OBGYN faculty is how the clinical faculty interface with the first and second year uh, uh, um, curriculum in which one particular faculty said, well, I go to the simulation suite and I watch how the students are trained to do a pelvic examination in the simulation suite and understand what kind of training they have before they come in and uh, to ensure that they are indeed prepared when they start their clinical clerkships. This was the psychiatry faculty and then the family medicine faculty. And this was quite fascinating to me because this was really unique about the school and something that would be considered a best practice for any school in California. These, uh, this particular group, one of their community engagement activities was to produce a map of, the, of areas in the country in which they could localize uh, uh, houses to diseases and conditions, and then also had students going out to these areas to do uh, projects to reduce some of the burden of diseases uh, in their uh, community uh, outreach projects. Um, we also had the opportunity to meet with faculty and interface with them in a variety of other ways over lunch, over dinner, um, and uh, during the tours. Then we met with a lot of students. I think it was 66 students total. 92, 92 sorry. Yeah. <laughs> there were a lot. We, we talked to a lot of people. Every, uh, we did it in these group settings, and we did it individually. And that's probably one of the most important things in which we get the chance to ask structured questions and in the unstructured environment. And uh, I wanted to just give you a sense, if you look at the pictures, to recognize the diversity of this group of students. They're learning bilingual medical education uh, for California to have a cadre of students who are clearly fluent in Spanish and English, clearly engaged in community uh, a wellness, community interventions is a big deal and something that the school should be quite proud of. So here, and the students came from all the different courses. We had students from the basic sciences, so we asked specific questions about how they were trained in the basic sciences. We asked the students about how they were trained uh, to prepare for their clinical years. And when it came to the students who were on specific rotations, we wanted to see how they got, uh, were aware of their curriculum, how they uh, did uh, log books, how they got their feedback, how they were able to give information on ways to improve the strengths and the weaknesses of the curriculum. And I think uh, universally, uh, we were impressed with how um, forthright the students were and how motivated they were to ensure that they were doing well, that the school was doing well, and that it was an environment that was conducive to constructive feedback. So anyway, as I go through this quickly, just to give you a sense of who are these individuals. Then we did a lot of touring of the uh, facility uh, because, of course, you want to see are there adequate resources. This is just, uh, these are all iPhone pictures, so none of them are going to be that fancy. But to give you a sense of what it was like there, this was me snapping a picture of uh, just a, a short segment of the school from their courtyard. And then up in the building, I uh, decided to take a picture out to show you what Santo Domingo, at least this little keyhole view of Santo Domingo, 
look like. I think it's the oldest city in the Western Hemisphere, something of that sort. I uh, probably would have a, a better description than that. We were working so hard, never got out to see much of anything. So uh, if you think it, we were out on holiday, we were not on, out on holiday. We were working from 7 in the morning till, uh, for at least for me, 11 o'clock, midnight, just uh, doing all the work that it takes to do this kind of activity. We went to classrooms. I think that's Dr. Nunez in the back of the classroom there showing that he's still learning something along the way. And then we looked at IT resources that they have av available, clearly adequate. We looked at their laboratories. Um, we looked at their uh, library reference resources, clearly sufficient for the uh, group of students. Uh, they had a courtyard area. This is uh, Dr. Lewis in the courtyard. And may I say thank you for, uh, uh, Dr. Lewis has very specific skills in speaking Spanish, which were <laughs> incredibly useful to us as we went through the day. Uh, this is us in the uh, preparing for the uh, uh, getting ready to go into the anatomy cadaver lab. Uh, so we uh, did everything. We looked, uh, there was no stone unturned. We went everywhere in this facility looking at every aspect of what, how the students are trained. We went to classrooms. This was a particular, uh, we got a brief chance to listen to a lecture. These were students learning how to read an EKG and how to understand how to assess uh, atrial fibrillation, a very interactive class, and it was interesting to see uh, at least how things actually work when the students are in class. This is their simulation suite um, during the first two years. Um, they get the opportunity to use some of the standard models that you might see, uh, and I'll show you some of those, such as how, uh, one that would be for um, uh, how to uh, 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 cardiac conditions and uh, running uh, perhaps an ACLS type of code and how to manage those or how to do an ophthalm uh, ophthalmology exam and assess the fundi. They also had standardized patients um, and one of the elements of this is that the students under observation were able to take a history, perform an exam, to do a write-up, to write an entry into the electronic medical record, to uh, start to see that before it even got out there, and to present a case to an attending. This is what you'd expect uh, to see in preparation uh, during the first two years for students on their clinical rotations. Then we went out on tour and we went to two hospitals and uh, one outpatient clinic. This was uh, 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 my background for research is uh, chronic disease type 2 diabetes. This hospital is dedicated to patients with type 2 diabetes. Uh, well, actually type 1 as well. And I'd never seen the like. It has 85 beds of patient volume of 125,000 patients per year and uh, uh, had a structure. This was uh, uh, um, uh, a uh, diabetic foot clinic. It was this large bay in which they had patient after patient getting cared for for their foot problems uh, that were commonly associated with type 2 diabetes. I'm, I just put this in because it showed that they were using algorithm approach method to determine if someone had vascular disease, neurologic disease, developing an ulcer, and everybody got intensive treatment for their type 2 diabetes. I'd never seen anything like that. And for a student to have access to seeing uh, uh, diabetic foot problems repeatedly over and over and over again in every form is extraordinary. Uh, there was a brief comment about too many learners uh, and how it impacts uh, the education. These students have an abundant opportunity to get a wealth of experience. It almost felt old school. It felt like the way when I was in medical school where you got a large patient volume. There weren't a whole lot of other learners, and you really got to roll up your sleeves and do things. Very impressive from my point of view. In this facility, uh, just showing you, we, were, uh, uh, we didn't stop talking to students. We had plenty of opportunity to speak to students in all different ways to ask more specific questions. We got to look at their call rooms, bunk beds and call rooms. I'm not allowed to use bunk beds in my facility. I have to use single beds. Uh, I'm not even allowed to have lockers in there. I use this when I came back to say, hey, let's get some lockers for our residents. And uh, their uh, bunk beds are okay every now and then. So they had classrooms in this facility. 
Uh, they had uh, Insu and Lena is a long story, but uh, there was a, uh, uh, at least a brief description of how if you have type 1 diabetes and you're under 18, your insulin's free and they provide a lot of services. I mean, they have an extraordinary methodology of trying to case manage a country uh, in which diabetes is as epidemic as it is in many other places. We then went to an outpatient facility um, to, uh, to see what that was like. And uh, this particular outpatient facility um, uh, um, uh, provides care to five to 700 families. They do a great deal of work in healthcare promotion, immunization, uh, uh, health interventions for families, chronic care interventions, coordination of care at other levels, uh, producing maps in which uh, interventions can be done, emergency and uh, care and disaster care. Just to let you know, it was pouring rain on us when we were there. <laughs> it was quite a rainstorm. And uh, I, if I gave you the sound effects with this, it was pretty darn loud. Well, I barely could hear ourselves think uh, during that particular storm. But we went through and talked to a lot of people, uh, saw what was going on with the kind of training. And again, this was uh, extraordinary opportunity for students to learn. Um, I wanted to again give you a, f uh, a sense of a face of the student, the typical student I met. I picked this particular individual out just to give you a sense of this is the kind of student that is at that school. Um, diverse, um, articulate, uh, clearly uh, motivated to care for the patients in the community and I was quite impressed. And just another snapshot, we always were trying to take snapshots wherever we were of the people we were talking to, asking them all sorts of questions. We then went to a third facility, an inpatient facility, large one, uh, 285 beds, large patient volume, and walked around again. This was one of the faculty uh, who was leading the way and giving us more instructions. Just to let you know, they do have a Zika clinic there. I didn't go inside, but I uh, just took a picture from the outside. We looked at other resources. I wanted to see how the students interface with the electronic medical record. Their electronic medical record is just as good as any electronic medical record I interface with, and they were showing me what they learn, how they find information, and so forth. Jim, can you try to summarize, please, because we have board members I'm going to lose fairly soon and I need to get the items done. Okay, I'll just keep going through this uh, quickly just to show you more slides. There were classrooms. We finally finished up. We went back and this is uh, the second to the last slide. <laughs> uh, and uh, essentially had conversation with the leadership. It was clear to us that the school meets all of the requirements of the business and profession code and all the statutes and regulations 13.14.1 uh, and uh, uh, a warrants recognition by the board. So that is the recommendation. Um, the, uh, um, since the school made its major intervention in 2009, our recommendation is that its recognition is retroactive to students matriculating from that time. That ends my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Nuovo. Board members have any questions? I think both uh, Dr. Nuovo and Mr. Warden or uh, Dr. Nunes can answer if you have any questions before I take a motion. Dr. Hawkins. Thank you very much. Just briefly, language is one thing. Comment about cultural competence. Impressive. Uh, the students got out there into the community and if you heard the specific stories of the things that they did, uh, they were quite impressive, as impressive as anything I've heard of at any medical school in California. Any other, yeah, Dr. Bola. I'll, I'll be very brief. Thank you for an excellent presentation and congratulations to your school, Dean. Um, in terms of the graduating classes, what percentage of the, of the students, where do they go for residency? What percentage is um, primary care and what percentage go into specialty care? Do we have that data? The leader, we did see that data. The leadership is better than me at that. We asked that question of everybody because uh, uh, they have an international track and a traditional track. The international track are those who allegedly are going to want to train in, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, but when we asked, about everybody raised their hands no matter what track they were in as to 
are you interested in training in the U.S.? Um, but uh, I think that I would leave that to the leadership of the school to tell you their data. Uh, Dr. Nunes, uh, I was going to give you a couple minutes to make a presentation because you're here for some, from so far away. But uh, please go ahead and answer and uh, just briefly give a presentation so that we can uh, we'll have the motion made. Well, thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk to the board. 80% uh, of the students, they want to come to the United States. Uh, some of them stay in the country, and some of them go to Europe and South America. Uh, I would say that 20% of the, of the graduates choose uh, family medicine. Uh, still, most of them want to do um, a practice in surgery, OBGYN, pediatrics. And uh, we are trying to promote uh, uh, family medicine with the government in order to try to, because the problem is the salary and also the position of the, of the graduates when they finish. Uh, of the people that apply for a residency program in the United States, the last year, the statistic we have, uh, we have from 110, 120 people, 70% uh, they match. And uh, still they have like 20%, 25% for family medicine. Still the other percent is for the other type of specialties. Thank you. Thank you. Again, thank you for uh, coming all the way from DR. Uh, can we have a motion? Actually, the motion should state, a motion to deem UNIB to be substantial, in substantial compliance with the requirements of California Business and Professions Code sections 2089 and 2089.5 and Title 16. Division 13, California Code of Regulations, Section 1314.1, and extend recognition to students who matriculate at UNIB on or after January 1, 2009. Long one. So moved. Dr. Hawkins. Second. Dr. Lewis. Any more discussion? Any public comment? Any comment on the phone? We have no comments on phone. Thank you. Roll call, uh, Kim. Dr. Balat? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Judge Feinstein? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ronis. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Jim. And you guys do hard work. I did go with you to New Orleans, and there was not even time to go to French Quarter, so I know how it is. Uh, <clears throat> I run a tight ship almost. Mm, yes, you do. <laughs> almost. Moving to item 21, update from the Application Review and Special Program Committee. Dr. Yip is not here. But I have his. Presentation. Okay. Shall I read it? Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lewis will present uh, for Dr. Yip. Since I'm the only other member of the committee, I'll present in Dr. Yip's absence. The Application and Special Programs Committee held a teleconference meeting June 22nd at 830 in the morning and reviewed the Kaiser Permanente Oakland Medical Center's request for a spine surgery fellowship program pursuant to Business and Professions Code Section 2112. Um, Dr. Yip and I were present during the application review and special programs committee and established a quorum for that meeting. Mr. Warden presented to the committee Kaiser Oakland's request for a spine surgery fellowship program pursuant to BMP code section 2112. After discussion of Kaiser's Oakland special request for spine surgery fellowship program pursuant to the BNP code 2112, a motion was passed to recommend to the Chief, Chief of Licensing approval of Kaiser Oakland's request for a spine surgery fellowship program for one fellow per year. The meeting was then adjourned. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. I, uh, Ms. Webb, I gather that this is one of the medical board approved uh, uh, programs, not ACGME approved? That's correct. Okay. 
Uh, do we need a motion for that? Or? It's just an update. Okay. So this is one where that committee actually makes the recommendation to the chief of licensing and then his decision. He's the final decider, decision maker. Okay. okay, thank you, Dr. Lewis. Any other comments from members? Okay, any public comments from the audience? Any comments on the phone? No comments on the phone. Thank you. We go to item number 22, discussion and possible action on proposed regulations for citable offenses, citation disclosure, and citation and fine authority for allied health professionals, Ms. Webb. Thank you, Dr. Gondadev. Uh, this is agenda item 22. This is a regulatory package that the uh, board looked at last board meeting and approved. And as we're going through, we thought that it would be important to add uh, another citable offense, and that's under Health and Safety Code Section 120370A, and that relates to a physician providing a parent or guardian of a child a written statement in indicating that the physical condition of a child or the medical circumstances relating to the child are such that immunization is not considered safe. And if the physician fails to either issue the exemption or issues the exemption below the standard of care, then this is something, another tool for the board to make sure that physicians are following the standard of care with regard to uh, immunization exemptions. Okay, so this came about uh, uh, 277, is that, uh, am I right? After the, uh, the, the law? Yes, okay. so this is in response to the, the new law. Any comments from the board? Any public comment? Any comments on the phone? And um, so I can, I can read the suggested motion if you would yeah, like. Yeah, I'm just trying to see. Any comments on the phone? There are no comments on the line. Thank you. Ms. Webb, go ahead, read the suggested uh, motion, please. It's to direct staff to prepare the necessary regulatory documents to submit to the Office of Administrative Law to formally notice the proposed regulatory amendments and schedule a hearing on the rulemaking to amend Title 16 Division 13, Chapter 2, Article 6, California Code of Regulations, Sections 1364.10, 1364.11, 1364.13, and 1364.15, and uh, the new changes to include Health and Safety Code Section 120370A, in addition to those changes already approved by the board. Thank you, Ms. Webb. Can we have a motion to that effect? So moved. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins, and thank you, Mr. Warman. If you can repeat the motion, I would love to hear it. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. So any, any comments? We went through this, but we still go through. Any, any comments on the phone? Do we have any comments on the line? No comments yeah. on the line. Uh, roll call, please. Dr. Balot? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Judge Feinstein? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Sutton-Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Uh, no doctor yet. Uh, Dr. Ghanadeb? Aye. Motion carries. Motion carries, thank you. Sorry, mosquito, we need to get out before it uh, gives Zika to us. Um, next item is uh, number 23. Discuss That's, oh. I'm sorry. Yeah, the discussion on possible action and proposed regulations updating the ma manual, of, manual of model disciplinary orders and disciplinary guidelines, Ms. Webb. So this is... is uh, a rulemaking package the board has already approved in uh, working to finalize it. Uh, 
there were some uh, issues that needed to be resolved for internal consistency, uh, language consistency throughout, and uh, some provisions that are, are in the language as it is, but in the notice language, they were left out by mistake. And so we wanna, for transparency, make sure that it's noticed appropriately. And uh, so I would like a motion to allow the board to make the corrections that I've outlined in the memo, to send it out for a 15-day comment period, and if no substantive negative comments are received on these no specifically re-noticed items, uh, that the board authorizes staff to make non-substantive changes and uh, finalize the, the rulemaking package for submission to the Office of Administrative Law. Thank you, Ms. Webb. Any comments from the board members? Any public comment from here? Any comments on the phone? No comments from the call. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the language as proposed in the second modified text and notice the language for a 15-day public comment period and if no negative substantial, substantial comments are received to authorize the executive director to make any non-substantial changes and complete the rulemaking process. So moved. Second. Okay, any comments on it? If not, I think we went through public comment already, Ms. Toof. <coughs> or Lisa, I mean. Uh, Dr. Balat. Aye. Dr. Bishop. Aye. Judge Feinstein. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Kraus. Aye. Ms. Lawson. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Sutton Wells. Yes. Mr. Warmoth. Aye. Dr. Uh, Dr. Ganadev. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. I, I do want to alert quickly that, that if, I'm not expecting them, but if there are substantive negative comments, we, we will have to have an interim meeting to address it. It's, so be, be on the alert. It's a standard process. Yes. And it will be <laughs> set up very quickly because we're up against our one year deadline. So it might be five minutes at five o'clock that we <laughs> we're like, here, do you have this time frame? So be on the lookout. Thank you, Ms. Webb. Thank you. Next item is item 24, update on the Interim suspension order study, Ms. Kirschmeyer. And I'll make this very brief. Um, at the last board meeting, uh, Mr. Serrano Sewell asked for an update on the ISO study and recommended policy changes. On pages BRD 24.1 to 4 is an update on the action taken to date. As you will I will not be going over the whole report. However, as you can see from pages two to four, several of the recommended improvements have either been completed or have been started. A few of the recommendations still need some work and need to be implemented. Although all of the recommendations have not been implemented, there were significant improvements from fiscal year 14-15 to fiscal year 15-16, and I would like to bring those to your attention. The number of ISOs increased 157% from 14 to 36 between those two years. In addition, the length of time it takes to obtain an interim suspension order decreased by 150 days. This is a significant improvement. In addition, the overall suspensions or restriction orders increased from a total of 52 to 84 for all types of restriction or suspension orders. Board staff will continue to work with the staff from the Attorney General's Office and the Health Quality Investigation Unit to implement all of the recommendations, and an update will prov be provided at a future board meeting. The one thing I do want to point out is that as we really start working on the cease practice orders, some of those will replace possibly some of the interim suspension orders that we're doing, so you may not see a constant grow of interim suspension orders, but between the two adding them together, we should still continue to see an increase in those numbers um, and again it is up to an administrative law judge to issue that interim suspension order but our hopes are that we continue to either stay the same or increase on the amount of suspension and restriction orders that we're able to obtain on physicians are there any questions okay thank you uh, Ms. Kirschmeyer actually we do appreciate the hard work uh, our staff is doing uh, important thing for this board is to get the few bad doctors off as fast as possible before they harm many other people. So that's what our goal is. So I think that's, that's very important.
Thank you. Any questions from the board? Any public comment? Any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone. Thank you. Next one is item 25, update on the outreach campaign, Dr. Lewis. I'm usually used to getting up and <laughs> doing this presentation, so. Um, I'd like to provide an update on the check up on your doctor's license campaign and uh, the board members, it's in pay, uh, tab 25 in your board packets. I'm pleased to report that the board's Office of Public Affairs has been very busy working on this outreach campaign and the board has been very successful in getting word out about the medical board to patients in the entire state of California. As I mentioned in my last update to the board that the a tutorial was being prepared entitled Check Up on Your Doctor's License. And this tutorial has now been completed and is now on the board's website as well as on YouTube. This tutorial walks the patients through the various steps needed to check up on a physician's license. The Check Up on Your Doctor's License brochure has also been translated into Spanish and should be available very soon. A message encouraging state employees, vendors, and contractors to check up on your doctor's license appeared at the bottom of all state warrants for the June 2016 um, pay stubs reaching 439,000 individuals. In April of 2016, issue of the California State Retiree Publication featured an article and an image of, of the board uh, brochure and it reached 34,000 state retirees. In May, San Bernardino County posted the board's information on its website and it reached 2,139,000 individuals. In May, in Tulare County, the health department there agreed to schedule the board's message on a Twitter account and also on Facebook throughout the year and this information was added to the spotlight <coughs> section on its website. In addition, they have created a network of digital signs that appear throughout Tulare County buildings and the Area Family Resource Center and various county clinics and it will carry the board's message and a very small article will appear in the Tulare County newsletter in the future and it will potentially re reach 466,000 individuals. Again in May, Monterey County Health Department posted an article about the board's outreach campaign on its website. And they have promised to post on social media as well, and it will potentially reach over 431,000 individuals. In Orange County, the healthcare agency there published a half a page write up on its June employee newsletter entitled, What's Up? Have You Done a Checkup on Your Doctor's License? It reached 3,000 agency employees. I'm going on and on because we've done so much work and it's, it's really taken off. Um, in June, Contra Costa County started running the board's message on its cable TV bulletin board, which is available to all county residents and has an ability to reach up to 11 million individuals in Contra Costa County. In June, the LA County Department of Health Services began posting on its board information the patient resources section of that, um, of that uh, uh, department reached 10.12 uh, million individuals. In Kern County, the Department of Public Health indicated they would immediately start to share board, the board's information, its social media sites, Again, 875,000 people. Stanislaus County Health Services posted on its uh, website various and uh, various facilities in the county, and that's reaching 525,000 people. Fresno County began to run a feature on its internet for the board's outreach campaign, targeting, uh, targeting a readership of 7,000 county employees. Then in San Francisco, the Department of Public Health published in it, the board's information on its website and through various social media, and that has the potential to reach 852 plus thousand individuals. 
CalPERS will be shortly running an article about the board's outreach campaign and its next member quarterly newsletter, Perspective, which is mailed to members' homes and also on its website. That has an audience of 1.7 million members. And CalPERS will also be posting a bulletin on its internet site, 2.9 million CalPERS employees. Board staff wrote a short article for CalSTRS, which will be published in several CalSTRS publications. Again, a readership of 900,000 people. So in summary, based on the successful outreach by the board, its messaging has been placed in publications that have a capacity to reach 17 million Californians. 17 million. Mm. So I am very pleased, very pleased with the board's work in its outreach campaign. Staff will continue to do these outreaches to various counties, cities, unions, other large community organization, and also our legislative offices. The board staff will also begin working on a public service announcement for its outreach campaign and hopes to have that completed by the next board meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. I knew I can count on you to get a break. <laughs> so, any comments from the <laughs> board members? Yes, sir, Dr. Hawkins. Just a quick question. Can we have any idea how many hits we're getting uh, at the website? So actually, as a matter of fact, I do. I knew that question would come up, so hold on just a second. So, I, w I wish I could show this. So this is in your most recent public affairs officer um, information that goes out to all of you. So I'd recommend you go and look at that um, because I can't really show y'all, but this is the spike that we have in June. And we're gonna get more targeted to where when we put out our specific um, QR, QR code, I think that's what it's called, that it will actually indicate where that hit is coming from so we can see different individuals. Um, but for the individuals who hit our site, um, it was 117,000 that actually hit the license verification site. But just to our website, it increased from approximately about 160,000 to 200, almost 220,000. So about 60,000 more hits just to our website, the difference um, between May and June. And it was about a, um, almost a 20,000 increase on our license verification. Thank you, any other questions? Any public comment from the audience? Comments on the phone? Do we have any questions on the line? Do you have a question? Please press star then one. We have no questions in queue. Thank you. Uh, moving to item 26, discussion on the process to revise the statement on marijuana for medical purposes. Marijuana recommendations, guidelines, and a policy on physician use of marijuana. Ms. Kirschmeyer. As most of the members know, Senate Bill 643, which became effective January 1st of 2016, required the board to consult with the California Marijuana Research Program, known as the Center for Medical Cannabis Research, on developing and adopting medical guidelines for the appropriate administration and use of cannabis. In addition, at the last board meeting, a member requested that the board review the two policies that were recently adopted by the Federation of State Medical Boards, one regarding the model guidelines for the recommendation of marijuana in patient care, and the other regarding a physician's use of marijuana. On pages BRD 25.1 to 2 of the board packet, you will find the board's most recent statement on recommending marijuana for medical purposes. This has been used as the board's guidelines for recommending marijuana. Additionally, on pages BRD 25.3 to 16 is the Federation's recently adopted model guidelines. In order to implement SB 643, the board needs to begin to review the current statement or guidelines and determine if changes need to be made. The best way to begin this process is develop, to develop a two-member task force to review the Federation's guidelines and the board's current statement and see if any changes are necessary. In addition, this task force could hold interested parties meetings to discuss this issue and can work with the CMCR to obtain their input on the guidelines. 
If any member is interested in being on this task force, please let me know so I can discuss it with the board president. Once the board president identifies this two-member task force, meetings can be scheduled to discuss the next steps to move forward on this issue. The other issue that was raised at the last meeting is a physician's use of marijuana and a policy on that issue. On pages BRD 2517 to 50, you will find the Federation's essential, Essentials of a State Medical and Osteopathic Act. The Federation uses this document to guide states in amending existing me medical practice acts and to encourage the development of consistent standards. 26. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's the number, the BRD is for 26. I have the wrong number. Sorry about that, everyone. So when I'm saying 26, 5, it's 26. Thank you, Dr. Donative. So it's pages 26, 17 to 50. You'll find the essentials document. Based upon the discussion by the Federation's Marijuana Work Group on the issue, it was determined that rather than have a separate policy on a physician's use of marijuana, that subsection D of the essentials document would be amended. Subsection D can be found on BRD 26, 33, and 34. It pertains to actions where a board should be able to take disciplinary action against a licensee. Specifically, section 19, and if you look at that section there, you can see that it has been amended to add marijuana into the list of substances that impair a physician's ability and could lead to disciplinary action. Although the task force may wish to look into the issue of a physician's use of marijuana, in looking at how the Federation handled this issue via its essentials document, and in looking at the board's existing law, specifically Business and Professions Code 2239, I believe the board already has a law that would allow it to take action should a physician's ability to practice be impaired by his or her use of marijuana. Therefore, the task force may wish to just use the existing law regarding this issue, similar to what the Federation recommended, rather than develop a policy. As the task force begins to work on this issue, more information will be provided on the future steps for this task force and future interested parties meetings where we can bring all individuals to the table. I wanted to let all the members know that I did receive one written comment um, this morning that I wasn't able to print out, um, but will be provided to the members and especially to the task force members. Um, and it's really regarding the in-person evaluation prior to a recommendation for um, marijuana for medicinal purposes. And, but I will be providing that to the members um, as soon as I get back to the office. So with that, are there any questions? Thank you, Ms. Kashmir. Any questions from the board? Do you have no comments? Public comment, we have a couple. First one Please. is uh, Fred Gardner. I'd like, Dr. Rob I'd like to call Dr. Robinson. Okay. Second one is Dr. Robinson. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Stephen Robinson. A physician with training in internal medicine and public health, and I am a board member of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians, and I'd like to read to you a comment that the board has submitted to the editors of the Journal of the American Medical Association in response to the Federation publication of their guidelines. This is to the editor of JAMA, Members of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians read with great interest the viewpoint in the online version of the Journal of the American Medical Association published June 16th by Drs. Chowdhury et al. entitled Medical Board Expectations for Physicians Recommending Marijuana. It summarizes model guidelines proposed by the Federation of State Medical Boards for its members. The lead author is president and CEO of the Federation, and I believe there are members of this body that were on the work group. The Society of Cannabis Clinicians, formed after the legalization of cannabis for medical use in California, has over 260 members across 24 states and three continents. SCC members have monitored cannabis use by tens of thousands of patients treating numerous medical conditions. The SCC sponsors the publication of O'Shaughnessy's, the Journal of Cannabis and Clinical Practice, and in 2014, developed the first accredited online CME program 
devoted to clinical cannabinoid medicine. The practice standards developed by the SCC for its members years ago already meet most of the Federation expectations. We have two principal concerns, however, regarding conflicts of interest, Chowdhury et al. state in JAMA that physicians should, quote, not be associated in any way, unquote, with a dispensary or cultivation center. This wording is far more restrictive than the actual policy ratified by the Federation. It would impede physicians wishing to collaborate with dispensaries and cultivators to study which specific cannabinoid terpenoid ratios patients find effective. Such data collection, in the absence of desperately needed clinical trials, can elucidate the clinical effects of various cannabinoids. An association for research purposes would not involve a financial interest on the physician part and should not be prohibited. Also worrisome is the recommendation by Chowdhury et al. that, quote, state medical and osteopathic boards advise their licensees to abstain from the use of marijuana for medical or recreational purposes while actively engaged in the practice of medicine, unquote. This provision does not appear in the model guidelines developed by the Federation Work Group, adopted as policy by the Federation House of Delegates in April 2016. Doctor, please conclude. The use of medical cannabis is not prima facie evidence of impairment or abuse, although most physicians enter rehab programs because of dependence on alcohol or opioids, the Federation does not recommend that users of recreational alcohol or prescription opiates suspend practice. Requiring physicians to do so would be unwarranted intrusion into a private doctor-patient relationship and stigmatization of providers making a rational treatment decision in consultation with their physicians about a medicine with a lower addiction potential than either alcohol or opiates. The proposed policy to disallow such usage is scientifically unsupportable. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Robinson. Uh, Mr. Gardner, would you like to? When I was listening yesterday, I heard Ms. Kirchmeier say that our, our mantra in, in regards to the doctors uh, inappropriately prescribing psychotropic meds for kid, foster kids, uh, our mantra is a complaint from somebody in the loop. I'm paraphrasing this. A social worker or somebody who sees evidence of this. Um, a complaint is obviously a, a much sounder basis for pursuing an investigation and an algorithm of the kinds that are being proposed uh, by the Federation. Uh, these algorithms involve the number of patients uh, a physician approves marijuana use by and the uh, number of plants approved. And as you know, the, <coughs> the ongoing stigma around cannabis, the fact that doctors receive no education about it in medical school has left a majority very reluctant to uh, recommend it and discuss it with their patients. So an inordinate number of the, the doctors who are willing to recommend it and monitor patients use is, is a relatively small group. They get an inordinate number of patients. The algorithm kicks in. They get investigated. Sometimes an investigator wants to make a case and uh, pursues it with great zeal. So it's a very dangerous a slippery slope, slope once you start introducing these algorithms. I urge the board to take a real careful look about what it's uh, approving here. Secondly, uh, the, the, all of you are relatively new to the board. The term of membership is, doesn't go back that far. In 2012, the Federation of, of uh, State Medical Boards got involved in a model policy guideline to, for more lenient opioid prescribing. It then emerged, there, there's a scandal associated with this. The, the Federation was found to be raising $3.1 million to promote its campaign, and they were being funded by Purdue Farm and uh, Endo and J&J, &J, the makers of the synthetic opioids that, we, that have led to the opioid crisis. 
So here we have the irony of the Federation pushing a lenient opioid prescribing policy and restrictive cannabinoid prescribing policy. And this, their fundraising operation is somehow tied in with these campaigns. So one wonders who is going to be funding the restrictive, who's trying to constrain these cannabis clinicians. And I wouldn't be surprised if the um, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, came up in the, as you look into that. But um, the, you're being, in, in my view, be very, in California, a million patients have used cannabis uh, reported benefit. It's been documented by their, their doctors. Um, we have nothing to apologize for in this area. Uh, we should be proud of the, the way cannabis has been used. We've pioneered this and introduced this medicine to the rest of the country and to the world. And I think the doctors who join the task force Please should um, should be very careful about what the what, look should ask Dr. Chowdhury and ask the Federation why are we pushing this campaign? What is the pro, where is the pattern of impaired physicians that we're looking into here? Where what, what's why are we doing this? Why are we taking time and taxpayers' money to do this? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Any other public comment on this item? Any comment on the phone? We do have a question from the line of Dr. Solomon. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. My name is Dr. Perry Solomon. I am the Chief Medical Officer at Hello MD. Um, one of the proposals in the Federation that I would like to address is in their model on page six under patient evaluation section, the first few words being a documented in-person medical evaluation. As a chief medical officer at Hello MD, which is a telehealth platform that provides remote, live, HIPAA compliant cannabis evaluations to patients from all over California for medical cannabis recommendations, I've seen firsthand how this modality has helped thousands of patients. We are able to have our physicians perform these evaluations for patients who are housebound, unable to obtain transportation to see physicians are unable to locate physicians who perform these evaluations, are frightened for their safety sometimes because some locations or storefronts located in uh, unsafe areas, as well as outrageous predatory charges from some brick and mortar physicians. From disabled veterans to the handicapped to the elderly, time and time again, we have heard, thank you for being there for us with your service from so many of our patients. We have over 1,500 reviews on Trustpilot that are 4.8 over 5 in terms of how satisfied our patients are with our service, convenience, and the quality of our physicians. <coughs> Telehealth has opened the door to so many people across the country that previously had no access to care or treatment. There are 28 states that now have telehealth laws that have provided safe and reasonably priced care to so many. By using remote evaluations, these states have provided over one million patients with access that they may not have received otherwise. Telehealth care is now mainstream health care, and there is no reason that cannabis evaluations should be excluded. The Medical Board in 2014 wisely acknowledged this fact in the Marijuana for Medical Purposes guidelines that telehealth was in fact an acceptable evaluation process when the board updated the old 2000 requirement, 2004 requirements to currently read, the initial examination for the condition of which marijuana is being recommended must be an appropriate prior examination and meet the standard of care. Telehealth in compliance with business and professional code is a tool in the practice of medicine and does not change the standard of care. Our physicians at HelloMD follow all of the appropriate medical board requirements that are necessary for a patient evaluation. Our physicians enroll in approved medical evaluation, medical education courses to raise their expertise far above the average practitioner for recommendations. And I hope this type of access of care will not be shut down for the many thousands and thousands of patients who depend on it, and you will not turn back the clock as suggested by the FSMB. Please and I conclude. would like to volunteer myself to help the board in any way to show the positive effects that telehealth evaluations have provided thousands of patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. 
Any other comments on the phone? No further comments on the phone. Please Thank you. Ahead. This item does not need any motion. So we'll go to our agenda item 27, update on the improvements and potential changes to the vertical enforcement program. Ms. Kirschmeyer. So again, at the last meeting, a member requested an update on the implementation of the vertical enforcement and prosecution model report findings and recommendations. On page BRD 27, 1 to 13, you will find a copy of the report that the board adopted in February and was released in March. On page BRD 27, 11, it lists the board's four recommendations for the VE model. Recommendations one to three would require legislation in order to make the changes recommended by the board in order to implement them. As discussed at the February teleconference meeting, recommendation number one pertains to the section of law that states that the investigator shall be, quote, under the direction but not the supervision of the deputy attorney general, close quote. As stated in the report, the board believes that this language may interfere with the investigators and attorneys being a true team, and therefore the language should be amended. However, it can only be done through a legislative change. Recommendation number two would allow some of the board's cases that do not get sent to the Health Quality Investigation Unit to be worked in a vertical enforcement model. These would include cases that are completed by our non-sworn in-house investigators within the Complaint Investigation Office. While there may be a way to do this without legislation, to make it clear for the Attorney General's Office, the law would need to be amended. The third recommendation also requires a legislative change due to the fact the investigators are no longer employees of the medical board. The entire vertical enforcement model is outside the board's specific authority as it is now written. The Department of Consumer Affairs and the Attorney General's Office are the ones over that um, program. Therefore, the law should be changed to state that the Department of Consumer Affairs shall perform the duties required in Government Code Section 12529.6e, which can be seen on page 13 of the report. The VE report was provided to the legislature with the recommendations. In addition, I testified at the sunset hearing regarding VE and went over the recommendations. Lastly, Ms. Somoza and I have met with the Senate Business and Professions staff to discuss VE and the board's recommendations. To date, no legislation has been discussed introduced to change the sections we were requesting to be amended. However, I know that meetings are still occurring and there is a possibility that changes may be made this year. If legislation is not introduced this year, these recommendations may be brought forward as part of the board's sunset review process. The board still continues to believe that legislative amendments are needed to improve the VE model as stated in these recommendations. Recommendation number four states that the Department of Consumer Affairs and the AG office should utilize the new joint manual and develop additional strategies and procedures to assist the investigators and attorneys to further improve the VE model. I'm happy to report that the AG's office and the department recently did joint training on 805 peer review investigations for both attorneys and investigators. The AG and HQIU will also be working on subject interview training. In addition, a new case disposition form has been developed that has assisted in the investigation closure or, or transmittal process. This has really streamlined the process. Lastly, a virtual shared workspace has been purchased that allows the investigators and attorneys to share documents throughout the investigative process. All of these changes should lead to efficiencies in the VE model. Board staff will continue to meet with legislative staff in the department to seek the legislative changes needed to implement the recommendations in the report. <clears throat> and just in talking to some of the offices and some of the um, individuals who work with VI, I just want to let you know that I think there are areas where the model works very well. And I'd, what I'd like to do and, and what I'm going to recommend um, to the board, not for you know, you don't have to vote on or anything, but one thing I would like to do is actually reach out to the offices where I think it's really working well and identify best practices. And I know one of those offices is in Northern California um, under the Sa San Francisco office as well as the Pleasant Hill office. And so that's one thing that I may be reaching out to um, both Director Kadani and to Ms. Castro um, to meet with them and say, let's sit down and look at what really works in this process and try to pull out some best practices in those areas that can then be used in other areas. So with that, that concludes my report unless there's any questions. I actually have a question. Um, are there any statistics available um, about cases and uh, 
when a, 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 an accusation is, no, when a complaint is received and the investigation begins, who the investigator might be and who the DAG might be and whether or not that stays consistent until the time that it reaches the board. Because I've found outside of this context, by and large in vertical prosecutions where time elapses, you really don't have a vertical prosecution effort because the investigator changes or the DAG changes and what you're trying to achieve by vertical enforcement and a team um, doesn't remain intact. So I'm going to... I'm going to answer it in twofold, kind of, because there's two different things at play with the way vertical enforcement has been set up under this model. So the first thing I can say is that due to the investigative um, retention issue, that there probably are numerous cases where you do not have the same investigator working on the investigation all the way through to closure, um, whether it's at the board level or even closure within the investigative unit. That's not something really anybody can take into effect because there's nothing you can do about that because um, individuals are just going to, you know, stay where they want to work or, or they'll leave. So I'm not sure. I, first of all, we, I don't believe that we have any statistics that I can provide to you that says this, these two individuals worked on this case all the way through the process. And there's nothing that I don't know of, and I'm not even sure that we'd be able to gather that information to provide you actual statistics on that. Um, but I do know that there are times when you won't have the same individuals working it. The other thing is the way that the, um, the vertical enforcement model has been implemented is that there is a lead prosecutor who actually is the one that is out in the field and handles a lot of the work on the case. And then there is another individual, and I'm blanking, I'm going to look to Ms. Simon, on the name of the other individual who works, then actually tries the case. Um, although that individual is, works on the case as well. That would be the primary deputy. Yeah, the primary deputy. And, and Ms. Simon, you can stay up here in case they have any other questions on that part. Um, but it is um, the lead, so there is a lead that actually handles a lot of the work, and then the primary one is the one that tries it. So. True vertical enforcement, I don't think they're, it's been implemented that way, the way you're talking about it, where it's really just that one person and one person that handles the case all the way through. But as much as possible that the AG's office can implement that, they have done that, so. I would say that's accurate, and it is um, usually the case that the primary stays the same from start to finish, but as Ms. Kirkmeyer indicated, the demands of people coming and going, workload, it's not always um, something we can accomplish. Um, we can't assign one deputy five cases in one week if that's the way the work flows and expect they're going to get pleadings out to meet the pleading deadlines and whatnot. So we do the best we can and it is generally the case that there is consistency throughout. Any other questions to Ms. Kirschmeyer? I mean, I, just a comment, uh, Kim, is that we made such a great improvement in ISOs, and it still concerns me where we are with the delays in the process it is taking. It's our Achilles heel, and we're still not there. Uh, uh, the change of law transferring the investigators to DCA didn't do much other than made it even further delay. So that's, that's a real concern and uh, we need to seriously look at how can we shorten the timeline. Uh, I have one public comment slip, uh, Ms. Julie, uh, Ju Julie D'Angelo Felmer. I was wondering, Julie, when you were going to make a comment today. <laughs> Good morning, um, or good afternoon, possibly. Julie D'Angelo Felmuth from the Center for Public Interest Law, um, <clears throat> and also the former Medical Board Enforcement Monitor from 2003 to 2005. Uh, in the spirit of full disclosure, I want to let you know that as a result of my November 4 initial report as the Medical Board Enforcement Monitor, my team and I did recommend that the board convert to this vertical enforcement model of investigating and prosecuting its complex physician discipline cases. Um, this agenda item, including the report and the recommendations, 
is, is accompanied only by this report that was submitted to the legislature uh, on the board, by the board on March 1. And I submitted a letter re registering several concerns about that report and the data in that report that have resulted in these four recommendations. And those concerns have not been addressed. First, the report uses only data that comes from the medical board, which necessarily comes from Breeze, which has not proven reliable. Secondly, the report presents only median case processing times. State law requires you to include case processing times in your annual report in both average and median time frames. And the use of median time frames only does not fully reflect long problematic delays, nor does it adequately measure quickly resolved matters, which may be quickly resolved due to the early involvement of the DAG. Um, and the new data that was presented yesterday uh, in BRD 7B14 through 7B17 do not correct that problem. Third, the report complains that VE has not speeded up the enforcement process. That complaint ignores the fact that the earlier involvement of the DAG is necessarily going to result in the early closure of minor or non-meritorious cases and with, uh, so that they can focus on more serious and complex matters, which will simply take more time. The data here presented here do not reflect what may be higher quality decision making about which cases to pursue and which cases to drop. Um, I suggest, and Dr. Ganadev, thank you for referring back to item number 24, which was the ISO report, vast improvement reflecting teamwork. Um, these people can clearly get along with each other when they put their collective minds to a problem, and that is the goal of VE, is to put the collective skills and minds of an experienced investigator and a skilled attorney together to process a case which may potentially protect patients from a dangerous doctor. Um, I, in my view, the, the, the VE model is being blamed for problems that have occurred since the transfer of the investigators to the Department of Consumer Affairs. Since 1990, it has been our position that the proper location for the investigators is in the Attorney General's office in the Health Quality Enforcement section so they can truly function as a team with the attorneys who specialize in your complex matters. VE is being blamed for the retention rate among the investigators. <clears throat> Excuse me. That is a problem that is decades old. That is a problem that um, could be resolved if you simply paid them more. So I'm happy to hear uh, Mr. Christ discuss yesterday the fact that he is, he is still working uh, on that issue. Um, we will op oppose any changes to the VE statute um, if it um, affects the, um, the <clears throat> excuse me, the ability of the prosecutor to direct the investigation. The prosecutor has got to be able to direct the investigation and be involved in the investigation. That person is going to get up in front of a judge and represent you, and he, he or she must have clear and convincing evidence that proves a violation of the Medical Practice Act that requires that the attorney be the quarterback of the team. That is a fact of life. That is how VE works in every law enforcement agency that uses it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Felma. <clears throat> Any other public comment from members in the audience? Any comments on the phone? Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one at this time. No questions from the phone lines. Thank you. That actually takes us to the last item, uh, agenda item. 28, agenda items for October board meeting in San Diego area. I would like to point out that October meeting, may, October meeting may require the board to meet on the Wednesday afternoon in order to review the sunset report. In addition, we will have two regulatory hearings, a presentation by Dr. Bolat on the UCLA IMG pilot program updates from our committees and task forces, and a report on the demographic study. Boy, that's a big agenda, Kim. Uh, do any of the members want to add anything to items to the October board meeting? We truly appreciate it. <laughs> Not adding, it's, it's a long meeting already. Uh, is there any public comment on the in the audience, from the audience. Any comments on the phone? 
There are no comments in the queue at this time. Okay, then the next one is adjournment. Motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Okay. Second. Do we need a roll call on this? No. No, no thank you. <laughs> thank you.